All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we got the one and only, one of the most iconic MMA fighters of all time, a founding father of the sport, a pioneer of the sport, and someone that is, it's honestly just an honor to have you here. We got Ken Shamrock in the house. Yeah, the first superstar of the sport. <laughs> How you doing, brother? I'm good, man. I appreciate that introduction. I'm, I think every time you hear it, you go, does that just mean I'm old? He's <laughs> 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 giving me credit for being the first and being old. <laughs> <laughs> Our sport is not that old, so you... you, sure, you, you sure. But you fought for a long time, though. Uh, I fought longer than I probably should have, but... Man, when you have that love and that desire to keep doing it and they keep paying you to do it, you're thinking to yourself, people are telling you to stop. You're going, listen, man, they're paying me to do what I love to do. Even though I'm not winning, I still love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's kind of a, an amazing philosophy to live your life by because it's not even like you were driven by the money. You're driven by the fact that you love to fight because ain't nobody fighting if they don't love it because you're getting hit in the face. You better love it. Well, and especially when you, you start knowing you're slowing down and then you look across the ring and you, you just in your head and it was never, ever a moment ever in my career when I walked in the ring and I didn't believe I was going to win. But when I got towards it, I had bad knees, bad neck, bad shoulders, and I'm going in there and I'm like, Literally, I'm just trying to fight that creepiness going in there of that that doubt because you know you didn't train completely the way you wanted to because of the injuries you had. You weren't able to go hard like you wanted to. And so you walk in there and as that little doubt starts to creep in, you go, get out of there, get out of there. So, you know, for me, like I said, in the end, it was just really about the desire to want to keep trying to defeat the odds. And that was to fight as long as I could. Yeah, that's what I'm going through right now. Yeah, uh, it's tough, man. Yeah. But 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 you know that that desire to want to do it just overrides. Yeah. I, I I look a lot at uh the fights and and the legacy that you kind of paved the way for for fighters, you know, with your your team and the way you operated and the way you presented yourself and the way you carried yourself and the sport. And I feel like you you did a lot to put the sport in a, in a mainstream movement, right? You, you did a lot to really put the sport on your back with the rivalries and the fights and really just the movement, like the, the pancreas rule set and then transitioning to like the UFC rule set. Just from there, just from the beginning for the, for the new MMA fans, how did you make that transition? Like how did you start there and then make your way over to UFC? Well, I think a lot of it had to do with when, when UFC came out and I think it was 93, um, I had already been doing uh, Japan since 89. Uh, I was going back and forth there. And it started out in the earlier days of what they would call catch wrestling or hybrid pro wrestling, where it was like they did the punching and the kicking and the throws and the submissions, but it was all worked. It was all predetermined uh, and it was all worked. And that was what, what originally I went over for. But then Fanaki and Suzuki uh, came to me and they wanted to, to see what it was if if they actually made it real uh and so they formed the group called pancras wow and uh, so it was really a pro wrestling kind of shooto style but it wasn't real the ending was predetermined but you'd still punch each other kick go to the ground do submissions rope escapes and Fanaki was, we were so frustrated because they were coming to us and wanting us to put these older guys over. And we're like, are we ever going to get a push? Like, because we were literally better than everyone else. And so he said, hey, we're starting our own organization. Uh, do you want to come with us? And I was like, hell yeah. Can I say that on here? Mm -hmm. Hell yeah. So we're say whatever you want. Yeah. Say whatever you I'm want. like, I'm in. And so we did our first one. And that's when I think. Um, Fanaki and Suzuki and all of them really knew because when you're doing the works, nobody really knows what you got because mm. you're always holding back. And I came from the streets. I grew up in group homes. I mean, I'm literally, that's how I survived. And so this stuff was easy for me. Like I wasn't getting stabbed, jumped or, you know, it was, it was simple, like one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, so when we did it for real, I was just jacked. I was like, yeah, but nobody really knew what my abilities were if I was to just cut it loose until that very first event that we had with Pancras where I literally fought Fanaki in the main event and they literally already had the celebration set for him because they didn't think I was, was going to be able to beat him and, and probably shouldn't have with the experience I had. But I, st I had that mentality, that street mentality. I was strong and nobody ever really understood how strong I was until I went live, which was that fight. Uh, and then I hit him with, and if you watch that fight, which was very interesting because it's the tell is, uh, when you watch it, the very first thing I do is I throw a roundhouse kick and I literally drive my toe 
Like it wasn't flat footed. I drove my toe into his rib uh, and you could see he squinched. And that was the, that was the literally the first time that he or anybody else ever felt me live. And I think I injured him enough to be able to go on and win that match because ground skill wise, they were so much better than I was. I just said that mental toughness, never give up. And I was strong and I knew just enough to stay out of trouble. Wow, that because that pen press does look kind of like Japanese pro wrestling with the ropes, mm -hmm. and I never put those two yeah. together until you just said that right he now. He goes, "Hey, let's see what let's see what this uh, hybrid pro wrestling looks like if it's real." <laughs> wow, that's genius. Yeah. That's, that's why those yeah. Japanese guys were so good coming on, like coming coming to MMA because yep. they was tra they had been training like the uh, hybrid pro wrestling. Well, and you look at it too in in the UFC you don't have to be well-rounded or then you didn't have to be well-rounded because if you had a good wrestling background, you could take guys down and just beat the crap out of them on the ground, like, and just keep them there. Well, in Pancras, you couldn't punch them on the ground. Like when you hit the ground, it was all submission. Mm. So it forced me to be much better at my submission skills. So when I went into the UFC, I was literally the first one that was the, the most well-rounded fighter because I even fought a Muay Thai fight against Frank Lodman, who was a former world champion in Muay Thai. And so I was forced in Japan to really understand stand-up and Muay Thai was just so perfect for the mixed martial arts fighting because close quarter elbows and close quarter knees and all that stuff just works so well with it. I was going to ask you about that because uh, I noticed back in the day, you knew submission before anybody else besides the Gracies, and, and you was the only American one that was doing submission back in the Where did you learn that from? Because only, only like Horse Gracie was doing, he was submitting people. Where did you learn it yeah. learn this from? Well, see, I was three years prior to the UFC coming to the States, which is in 93. I was over in Japan in uh, 89, 90, 91, 92. And so I was studying all of that stuff um, over there. And so when they did this, I was looking at it going, Damn, like they're literally close. We didn't do it. When you hit the ground, there was no punching. It was all straight rope escapes or submissions. Yeah. Stand up was all the striking. And so when they showed that, I was like, dude, they're going to let me just beat the crap on somebody on the ground. Like I literally take them down and beat them down. And I was like, I want to do that. And there was a conflict with, because I was the champion. I'd literally had beaten Fanaki uh, for the title. And so I had captured. And then three days prior to me going to do the, the show, um, in Denver, because I never thought this was going to be real when they said no holes barred. UFC anything, one, you know, UFC one. Like I was like, this ain't happening. There's there's no way they they have rules and regulations. There's no way this is going to happen. So I'm like, okay, this is bullshit. But I'm going to go ahead and say I'm going to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. So I go over to Japan and I fight Fouquet to defend my title, and I end up hitting him with a knee, knock him out with you know two or three minutes into the fight. And uh, so we jump on a plane, Fanaki, a doctor, and a guy I knocked out, Fouquet. They came with me to the fight. And the whole time I'm like, I'm going to get there. They're going to pull us aside. Okay, this is how it's going to work. Because, like, this is the U.S. You just don't you just do not do those things, right? You can't do that. And so we get to it and you do the, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, uh, press conference, so-called press conference, probably about 10 reporters there. Nobody knew anything about it. <laughs> And uh, they do this punching thing and everybody's showing off. And I'm looking around and I, I'm just like thinking to myself, who are these guys? I don't know any of these guys. <laughs> the only person I knew was Gerard Godot because he fought over in K1. He was in Japan. So I knew he's, he was from there. And, okay. and I literally thought that's my competition. And I was like, I'm, I'm going to destroy him because he's got one dimension. And he's a striker and that's it. So I'm thinking I'm going to destroy him. And I'm looking around the rest of it and I don't know anybody else. And, uh, and so uh, I remember seeing Hoist walk up and I was like, and he, he, he was probably, I mean, they always lie about their weight, right? The guy is an inch taller than me. His shoulders were wider than mine. So he's probably about 180, right? 180, 190, somewhere around there. And uh, he's walking around and he's got this gi on. And I'm like, and my whole life growing up, when I see somebody walking around with a gi on, I'm like, jabroni. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, why do you walk around wearing a gi? And so he comes in and I'm thinking to myself, what an idiot. This kid's going to get hurt because he looked young too. <laughs> jabroni. Yeah. And so he comes in and it's like, literally, I just had no respect. I just thought, boy, this, and I felt bad because I thought this kid's going to get hurt. And he goes in there, man. And I remember uh, I actually won my first fight. And then I'm going against him. I'm like, 
And I watched him in the first one. He fought Art Jimerson, who had one glove on. Art was confused, like, hey, bro, bare knuckle. Glove helps you. Does not help you. So we ended up going there. Next thing I know, Hoist is choking me with the gi. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, shit. I just got my ass handed me the guy walking around in a gi. <laughs> you never, you never, oh, fought, uh, you never fought about it in a no, gi before. No, never, never. But just it's the... It's that humility when you know, and, and I've always been good about that, right? I mean, I, I'm not, never been that kind of a jerk where yeah. I don't learn from my mistakes. But when he did it, I thought to myself, that's on me. <laughs> that one's on me. Cause I didn't, res- I didn't respect him. I didn't, I thought nothing of it. Really? And yet they're all promoting this guy. Like, like he's something. And I should have known right then and there, there's more to that story. <laughs> yeah. But you knew his family and who he was though, right? Or I, no? No, 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 no one knew about the Gracie's wow. back then. No. Wow. No, man, it was all crazy. just a mystery. And I watched tapes of him, man. And even the tapes, when you watch it, doesn't really do it justice until you until you actually feel a gi and get in there and start rolling with somebody that understands the gi. Mm-hmm. Then you're like, okay, I get it. Because yeah. I could be strong. I mean, I, I was strong, man. I bent 605. I was, I mean, I was strong. And there was nobody ever, anybody in my life that if I got into a fight with that, I did not outpower. Right. I mean, I just could, I just had that freaky strength and with him, I couldn't, and he was 180, 190 pounds. And yet I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't just rip him apart. Yeah. It was just weird. Like never experiencing like that in my life. It's, it's interesting to me because a few things with that story is one, and I, and I kind of want to unpack this for the audience too, because I really feel like the legacy and the impact you had on the sport, we need the, the new age media to really cover it and highlight it in, in the proper way. So these stories don't get lost in transition with these kids that are just on TikTok. But uh, a lot of a lot of people have talked about that story that you flew over from Japan with like the hit squad of, of the guys who were like beating up in Japan. Like they were like your corner, <laughs> your team. Like, is that true? Or how did that work? I wouldn't say I was beating up on Funaki. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had our battles, but uh, I brought guys over from Japan because that's who I train with. I mean, that's so how you I flew to UFC with those guys. Yeah. I flew wow. from Japan. Uh, I don't remember if I'd gone, it was a while back. I don't remember if I'd gone home first or if I flew Got directly it. from, I, I, I feel like I flew directly from Japan to um, Denver. And it was like three days prior to the event. Uh, again, don't quote me on yeah, that, yeah, but yeah. that's what it, I, and I've said this for years, uh, that that's what, what we did, but it was, it was quick. And yeah. I didn't even think it was going to happen. Like, I mean, I, I just thinking in my, there's no way you're going to kick a dude in the head. Yeah. Walk up and just boot him in the head while he's on the ground. I mean, we just didn't do that here. <laughs> like I was doing it in Japan. I thought that was extreme what we were doing and we didn't hit each other on the ground, but we were doing both striking kickboxing and submissions together and i thought that was extreme yeah like because there was nowhere i could train at in the u.s like go into a boxing gym or whatever then i say hey i'm gonna take you down they look at me and say no you're not <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah it's no, like they no just one to train don't with. do it right so how did those guys agree to were you guys all friends even though you were fighting each other how did they agree to be like your corner or your team how did that happen yeah i mean it was just a close um, knit of uh, group of people and got it and you've been over there you know how it works it just you're just around a bunch of guys and everybody's there to compete uh when you get in the, in in the ring it's it's serious but when you're out man you have a good time it's that's like, awesome cuz there's not a whole lot of people in, in Japan and especially in that group and so everybody's just kind of cool with one another so you're like hey boys we're going to the US we're going to this event and you took you took the squad with you yeah, well that's that, a documentary yeah. <laughs> that's like rolling to the the US with the Motley crew of well, just fighters yeah, from it Japan it wasn't quite that easy either because I was under a contract with them too so they were trying to protect their their oh, me the got champ it, got it. oh that makes <laughs> so sense. They, they had other interests yeah. <laughs> when you was training submission in J- in Japan, what was it called? Was it just called submission? It wasn't called Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Was no. It? See, we were completely different. It was, it, and we would call it here now, we call it catch wrestling. Okay. Um, and that's the closest style that it would come to because on the ground, you didn't hit anybody, right? Mm-hmm. It was like wrestling, but with submissions. Mm-hmm. Then you stood up and then you did the kickboxing. And so for me, I thought it was the most purest form of both where um, you had to be well-versed in both in order to succeed in pancreas. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's why a lot of guys like Boss Root and Sakura, and so, not so much Sakura, but Sakura trained the same style, even though he did the jujitsu. Mm-hmm. But in Japan, it was a little bit different because of the leg locks and all that. So it was, it was just, it, it was more of a pure form of being able to strike when you needed to strike. 
And then when you hit the ground, it was all pure submission. So it forced guys because like Boss Rudin and different guys that would go over from Japan that came out of that organization. Josh Barnett was another one yeah. that literally mm-hmm. dominated when they got into the UFC because they were forced to be good at both. Yeah. So so Pancrase was around way before the UFC. Yeah, it, and it and again it produced, in my opinion, uh, much better fighters because they were forced to have to know both striking on stand up, the kickboxing and all, and the grappling on the ground. They At the were same well time, when people just came to the UFC only knowing one martial art, yeah. that's what he's saying. Yeah, that's the craziest thing. Yeah. Like a guy guy fighting a UFC fight with one boxing glove on. Right, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. That's crazy. To right. Me. So during this time, yeah. when people when the UFC one first started, guys just coming in knowing one thing. It was guys already in Japan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, that were fully mis- mixed martial arts. We just wasn't seeing that yeah. over here in America. That's right. so amazing. That's exactly right. Yeah. Did you already have the Lions then go in when you were in Japan? How did the Lions then form? How did you, like, we've heard stories of the brutal tryouts and the chaos and you finding warriors, like, looking around the globe for guys like Achilles. And, like, how did you build this team? How did that all happen? Well, and you look at it in the early days, Jerry Bowen went in his first time, and he beat a guy that was a five-time Brazilian champion. Um, and but just from his a year and a half of living in the, the Lions and House and training, because that's all we did. My brother Frank was tremendous, man. He was another, he went, he was like, my, my, uh, <laughs> my ceiling was his floor. I mean, like, he literally took it on even and beyond what I was capable of doing it. So there was just, like I said, that training and that style that we did was just so far advanced at that moment especially since we were seeing what was going on in the usc at the time and you seen the lions then when they came in because of the way we were training and we were training more in the japanese style which is the catch wrestling um when they did go into the ufc every single one of those guys won their first fight yeah um and so and that i attribute it to was because of the training that we did and i took that training from japan even their tryouts um because they were so brutal in their try They've had a couple guys where they literally killed guys in tryouts in Japan. No um, way. What one was guy the got kicked in the head and he died. Suzuki kicked the kid in the head and killed him. For real? Uh, yeah, I kid you not. Did he go to jail for that? No, no, because they, like, Japan's different. <laughs> they're, they're in the dojo, they're training, and it, it's it's part of it, right? I mean, you get wow. hit with a shot and you die. I mean, who's at fault? You're there training. Wow. wow. Was it was it like classified as an accident or something? Yeah, it was, yeah. yeah. And I don't know all the ins and outs, but nothing happened they gave the family a bunch of money and they had a what you know the funeral and all that stuff oh, and it, it went on but i took wow. that training and what i learned and everything that i know is is from japan that's that's how i did it because i felt like th- how i grew up here and going through the streets and the hardness and all that um i felt like everything that i saw here karate and and all the other things that that went into this this so-called martial arts world was soft to me. And so when I went to Japan and I started watching this and I started training in that, I looked at it and go, now this, this is how people should train because there is no mercy. Either you, either you're going to stay and you're going to do the training and you're going to work hard or you're going to be gone and you're not going to be gone because, you know, uh, you, you just decided you're going to, you're going to be gone because you can't handle the training. Mm-hmm. And if you can handle the training and you make it through, now you know you got somebody you can train and be great. Mm-hmm. It's like Navy SEAL training or something. Yeah. What yeah. was so what was so rigorous or brutal about it? Uh, I think it, and and from what I picked up there, it's really it's it's not just a one dimension thing because you can get guys that have just nat- and I've had them, but I've literally kicked some of them out because they just they're just not. They're just, they have the natural ability to fight, but there's a lot of other stuff that comes with them, and it destroys your team. There's cancer. Like, literally can be good, but it because they don't follow rules, because they're always screwing around, it causes other people to fall because they don't have that support with the whole team. And so I would get rid of them. I wouldn't, I wouldn't keep them there. And how you do that is, is that you increase the training and you make sure that every, not just one person or two people, but everyone has to go through that training. You get somebody that has natural ability and that's good you, and, and, and has the bad attitude is usually the one that doesn't want to put full effort into all the training and you see it like a sore thumb. And then you push that and you push it until they end up getting mad and leaving or doing whatever. But that's how we built the lion's den and really built a solid core of guys, not with just great ability, but also with good character. 
So that's the original model for a, a combat team or a fight team. The line yeah, is that they, they was one of the first ones. Yeah. Well, in the military too. I mean, yeah. I was in the Marine Corps er, oh, way wow. early on uh, after I got out of college playing football. And um, that's some of the things that I learned through there was um, the discipline. Um, even though someone may be great at something, you also have to make sure that they're going to pay attention. They're going to listen to orders. They're going to listen to what you need to do to be great. And so being able to push somebody and push them past their limits, you have to be able to do that in order to get the best out of someone. And if that somebody isn't willing to do that, then you're never going to get the best out of them. Damn. Damn. I I feel like the philosophies that you have on combat sports, mixed martial arts, and even being an owner or a team captain in a way is kind of, it's a little, not lost, but now in today's time, there's so much business that goes into these fight teams and these, and these, uh, you know, the, these gyms that it, it, they lose sight of a lot of that character building aspect. It's more about the money, the content, you know, talking. Uh, I, I don't know if it's the gyms. I just think it's the way the, that this the system's set up now mm-hmm. because I can't do the training that I do now because I'll never keep anybody. And the reason why I won't keep anybody is because there's a gym four or five blocks away that'll get them a fight in, in three, three months or two months or maybe even in a week, they'll get them a fight. So if I go and I say, I bring in like I used to do, they had to train there for six months to a year before they ever got a fight and, and sometimes longer. But if they were good enough and they learned fast enough, it'd be six months to a year and they get a fight. But they had to go through all of that training and put in that work in order for them to get there because it was almost like they had to earn it. Like they had to make sure that they put that training in and that if they walk into that, that, that ring that they're not going to see anything they haven't already seen in training. And so... Now that doesn't work because if I tried to do that now, three months in, they're going to have somebody that's got a, a, a gym, you know, an hour away or 45 minutes away. They're going to go there because they're going to say, hey, man, I'll get you a fight in four weeks. You don't have to put six months in. And, and it's just not going to work because people naturally want mm-hmm. to be in the limelight without really having to go through the hard work first. Mm-hmm. Take the easy road. People want things faster now. I, I call it the microwave effect. Just, <laughs> yeah. you know, people want stuff That's instantly. Yeah, like Instagram. Yep. Instantly. Mm-hmm. Microwave. They want yep. it faster. Yeah. I mean, give it to I, me now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, it's and and it's true though. But we we also do see so many more fight organizations and so much more going on that these coaches, everybody's making money off purses, and there's so many egos. So everybody just wants to be be in content. Speaking of 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 content, you were you know on the Ultimate Fighter. You had the whole Tito saga, the rivalry. It elevated, you know, everybody's career in a way. How much do you think that that really elevated your career, his career, the UFC? Like, how important do you think that rivalry was to to mixed martial arts? Yeah, I, I mean, I can't speak on it. Uh, I'm not behind the scenes. I don't see the numbers, but it, it felt like it had a significant um, mm-hmm. place in the history books because, from my understanding, they weren't doing well. In fact, is the numbers pretty much showed it. I think Tito, a tremendous fighter, uh, probably at that point in time, pound for pound was the best fighter in the world. I mean, he was, he was it. Problem was, there's no one for him to fight. I mean, there was literally, they were bringing these guys in and there were, I think the buy rates were 30,000. I mean, it was ridiculously low. And I know, um, I had gotten approached about, you know, fighting him and I had knee issues and I was uh, trying to get it fixed and uh and when i was approached they asked if i would want to do the fight and i was like yeah i just got done with japan and i ended up losing i think i had a three fight contract and i lost two of those fights and won one of them and i was like i ah, probably should take some time off and, and heal up and, and reevaluate you know what i'm doing and then i got hit with this it's like hey you're interested you want to fight <laughs> tito and we already had some beef before that and i was like without even thinking about it hell yeah i'll fight him <laughs> <laughs> So, um, and it was crazy too, because I, I had to study the numbers because when I approached them with the deal, because I learned a lot from WWF, uh, on, on, you know, how to, you know, maximize your opportunity to make money through buy rates and, and taking less up front and more on the back end. So kind of worked that, that, and I was the first one to actually bring that in, uh, uh, to the UFC where, you know, the numbers started becoming more important. The buy rates yeah. then became more important. And so I took less up front and I remember, um, uh, going through that whole process. And I remember looking at those numbers and it was like 15,000, 30,000. These were Tito fights. Mm. 
and they were stupidly low. And I'm thinking to myself, this guy is one of the greatest fighters in the world right now in mixed martial arts, and they can't sell they can't sell these buy rates. And I remember telling Dana, I says, I'll, I'll blow that up. And he looked at me, he said, yeah, people keep saying they will and they won't. And I said, I'm telling you, I can do it. And I just knew how to sell a fight. And so, sure as shit, I told him a number, which was a stupid number. And I said, I'm telling you, I'll do it. And again, this is hearsay. Doesn't mean I'm right or wrong, but I'm telling you what I know was that um, there was a number I was supposed to hit and I crushed it. And I was told we just missed it by one or two buys or something, something stupid. And they, and like, they didn't pay you. Yeah, so it was 100,000. Say, say, just say a number. It was 100,000. They said we did 99. And I just did not believe that, that after what we just did, because it, it, it was a different world after I came there uh, with what they were doing prior to that. We were getting ready to shut the doors. Things were not working out. And I got there and we did that fight and we were everywhere. Best damn sports show. We were everywhere and blew it up. And, and Tito was a part of that. I mean, I needed him in order for us to do this thing, to make it happen. So it was both of us. He just didn't have somebody like me at that time for those numbers to go where they needed to go. And I was the perfect fit at that time. And so we killed it. And then come to find out after I had redid my restructured the contract and did all this other stuff, uh, I found out what the real numbers were. And that's when it was a problem from that point on. It was where my troubles began. Bro, they did the same thing to me when I when I fought Rashad Evans. I had a crazy contract. Yeah. If I got over a million buys, yeah. my pay-per-view numbers went all the way up here. <laughs> yeah. So they told me we we did just under a million buys, but in the press, he said that we did over a million buys. And I told him, I said, Well, pay me like you told pay me like you told the press. Pay me the, off the numbers. The numbers you're like, supposed to pay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I I so I I don't know. But I got I got paid like we didn't hit a million. That's not fair. That's not fair. Now you with, now with after they sold it for four billion. That's that's a sad because right. there's got, there's a lot of guys. You know, I mean, you look at you know Pat Militech and 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 you know, um, I mean, there's just I could name yeah. twenty guys that yeah. built this company. Yeah. Uh, so that they're able to have those comforts and not and again, not one of them were fairly taken care of. Right, right. What, what was, do you remember the name of that, that, that fighter that he used to fight in um, camouflage shorts? The white guy, he was smaller. He had... That was Mikey he, Burnett. Mikey Burnett. Yes. I was a big fan of him. Yeah, he was pound for pound one of my best fighters, man. And, wow. and same thing happened to him. I mean, literally they... And this was not not the the, the new regime. This was the old regime yeah. where I got into a big fight with them because they, they, they he won his first fight. They said he'd get a title shot after him and Militech fought. And it was... Yeah. I thought it was a damn good fight, but I really thought that Mike pushed the fight. And I thought he beat him. And of course, whatever, no big deal. Okay, we'll give him a rematch. So he fights this guy that was supposed to be a stud. Mikey just destroys him. So then they say, well, yeah, it's, we're going to have to fight one more time. And Mikey's like, he's mad. He's like, okay, I'll do it. So he fights this other stud and he destroys him. <coughs> and then we literally go, okay. And then they said, well, yeah, but we're just not ready for their rematch. And I literally blew up. And went off and, and got angry. And then Mikey quit and yeah. went into boxing. Yeah. He wow. was a great he was the first one to bring boxing over to MMA. Yep. And I used wow. to watch him I'm like, man, I want to fight like him. Yeah. And he wore the camouflage. He, he wore the camouflage. And he just quit the UFC? He quit, man. And he did he, he How did he do in boxing? He, he he did okay, but there's no money. Like there was yeah, during yeah. that time boxing was going down the other way and, and, and MMA was going up. Yeah. And I felt bad because I couldn't I mean, I felt bad because I told them we'd get him that fight and they kept blowing me off and wouldn't give it to him. And and this is nothing, this is no shine on, on Pat because I think Pat would have fought him if that's what they would have put in front of him, no problem. But for whatever reason, because we had the middleweight title and I had the heavyweight title. And if Pat wins that, we have the wheel, right? And that's a lot of power for one team. And I think Man. that's probably why that fight never came around again was because they didn't want... And it was, and again, no, no matter what anybody says, that Mike had a shot. Mikey had a shot at beating Pat, just as Pat had a shot at beating Mike. Mikey, they were both that good, mm -hmm. and uh, we would have had all three belts. And and I'm just not sure they wanted that much in one camp. 
There was only three weight classes back that, then? That was it, yeah. There was yeah. The, the lightweight, middleweight, and heavyweight. Damn. Yeah. That's crazy. Hey, I, I don't know if you remember this, but you came to one of my, a couple of my fights in King of the Cage. Yeah, I know, I know. You, you oh, what a fight, man. Yeah. I saw this the first time I ever saw him. I'm, that other kid. Well, uh, uh, was it Marvin Eastman? My, was yes, it my first, Eastman. My first fight. Wolf. Hey, Damn. Bro, you remember it. I mean, oh, he's, I he's getting giddy right now. Oh, I, I became, yeah. I became oh. champion because of you and your, and your words. Yeah. yeah, your your words. I remember. It, I never forgot it. Yeah. I, I never forgot it. Like I was, I was there fighting, and and he was like, you was like, you you saw something to me. He said, man, this kid I got did. something. He said yeah. he could be champion. I, I didn't, did. I didn't know. I this was my first professional fight. And I yes, about, that's I said, why. I said, that's why I said it. <laughs> yeah, I was like, Ken Sharrock said I could be champion. Yeah, and then always, and then always like stuck with me. And I and I and after that fight, I went on a win. I didn't lose again till Sakuraba. Yeah. I lost to wow. Soccer Robert, and I always I remember his words. You came and watch one of my fights. I took that ultimate orange because Joe Stevenson <laughs> gave me the ultimate orange because yeah. I, I I didn't have time to train hard. I didn't have my cardio, and I was <laughs> and I was throwing up. And Ken was like, "Boy, you gotta get your cardio." <laughs> What's ultimate orange? <laughs> it was like, a drink back then. Yeah, you drink it, they supposed yeah, to give you like extra cardio, but I don't know. I did too much what? or something. I threw uh, it up after my fight. Well, but I didn't want to lose. I, I saw him that 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 fight, and they said that was his his first fight, and I was like. This kid is special. Because wow. Marvin Eastman was a star. Oh, yeah. How old were you? 21, maybe. Wow. Yeah. You were young. That was a yeah. hell of a fight, man. Yeah. That, was a, that was a great they fight. They told me he was just a kickboxer. I didn't know yeah. he was a wrestler. <laughs> You're like, it's too took, late now. Yeah. I took the fight in two weeks' notice. Yeah. That was your uh, first ever fight? My first special, professional, professional fight. I had yeah. fought two fights before yeah. that. But that was for the belt? No, no, it was just in King of Cage. But it. but the thing is, is that when you went in there, you just thought it was a squash match. Yeah. Like, this was just a setup for, for more of a, just a squash. Yeah. yeah. And all of a sudden, you're like, okay, this is a fight. <laughs> and it was a hell of a fight, yeah. bro. That was wow. a great fight. And that's yeah. when I was like, man, this kid, man, he, he's going to be special. That's unbelievable. Have you ever had a chance to tell him that story? No, it, no, it was because of you. I became yeah, champion. I appreciate that, brother. No worries, it's the first man. time ever, huh? You got to tell him that in person. Well, yeah, I, I never, I never, I never talked. We haven't seen each other that much lately. And since usually, when it was, it's, it, he was either fighting or I was fighting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you guys, you guys had a little bit of a connection too, because I believe weren't you in Tito's camp when he yes. fought? Shamrock? I probably, yeah, I probably was in Tito's yeah. camp. And there was a lot of controversy during that as well, because there's those videos of Tito yelling at you. You're on the cage, right? There's different fights, and a lot of people like they kind of mix match the timeline here because you had the ultimate fighter you had the fight you have the controversy but for that specific time why was why was tito yelling at you and you were on top of the cage and you're yelling back at him there's a famous video clip of this yeah and it's the shirt that he wore and it said um something about mesger's my bitch or something or or something to do with, i don't remember exactly what it was mm -hmm. but somebody said that, that he's what because he, he'd do the famous shirt stuff mm -hmm. and and uh, when I was in the corner there, and if you when you watch that fight, I was just disappointed that the fight got stopped because they were both exhausted. And he was literally on the side with Guy, and he's doing this, like this, and he's tired, right? And there's no damage being done whatsoever. And Guy's just laying there like this, and Tito's sitting there just doing this, like, and there's no power, and all of a sudden the fight gets stopped. And I was like, what are you doing? And you know, because yeah. you're getting your corner and you're yeah. you're up. And he's like, "What are you doing?" He's like, "He's not defending himself properly." I said, "He's not hurting him." <laughs> like you know, that as a corner, you're trying to fight for your guy. Well, <laughs> then all of a sudden, I think it was Mikey actually told me, "Hey man," because we had no, we heard about the shirts and stuff. And I told him, "If he does that, man, we're 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 gonna jump in the ring." And uh, so all of a sudden, they said, "Hey, he's wearing a shirt," and so we jumped. So that's why all of that happened. And it really. The thing is, is there really was, for me anyways, there was really no real true beef. To me, it was all about selling tickets and mm -hmm. always had been about selling tickets. It's not that I didn't mean it. It's not that I didn't, that I wasn't angry. Yeah. I put myself there because I know this is how this business works. Wow. And so Tito just kept feeding it more and I kept getting angry more and it just played well. After that fight was over, even after our last one, I said, hey man, we made, we, we did good business together. Like literally yeah. just wanted to let him know we're done. Like, and that's how I, my whole career has never ever been personal even though it feels that way because mm -hmm. that's how i am i want if i can't keep it real and make it real for everyone out there how are people going to believe what we're doing oh, and absolutely. so but it's never i'm never taking it outside of that yeah. it's never going to go outside the ring ever yeah it's it's interesting 
concept because I feel like the way you looked at business and the UFC and MMA, you kind of gave Tito a crash course and then he was able to use that for Chuck and then Chuck used that for the next guy. And it's kind of like you kind of set the ground rules on like, guys, we're here to, we're here to put on a show. We're here to sell tickets. Like Rampage, you always say you were there to make money. You're there to sell a show, make sure it's not personal. You know what I mean? Like entertain the fans. Yeah, that's, what, that's what it's all about. That's what I boiled down to. You got to entertain the fans. Did you learn a lot of this at WWF, WWE? Like, where did the business side of you come from on how to sell fight, how to pitch it? This is exactly when I started a crash course over in Japan with the Shuto, oh, you know, yeah. and, and it was just entertaining because the fights weren't real when we were doing the old, the, I forget what it was called, but um, then when we, we created Pancras, which was the first real shoot uh, where we wanted to know what it was like to be real. Um, all of that stuff I learned in pro wrestling and the hybrid pro wrestling and the, the, the entertainment value of it, I carried over into the fighting because the one thing I was told was that why is anybody going to watch your fight when there's 10 or 12 of them on the card? Why you? And so in my mind, I was like, okay, yeah, why me? Mm. And so you have to make sure that you're, you're planting a seed and to every one of these people that are out there watching whatever you're saying on an interview or whenever you get a chance to get in front of the media, you need to give them a reason why they want to watch your fight. Damn. Mm. It's interesting. To, it's interesting to look at fighting that way. Cause at that, at the other end of that spectrum, you still have to fight and, and, yep. and kill someone in the ring. Yep. Not literally, but you still have to go in there and kind of put together a, a fight like you still got to remember how to fight you can't just you're not just entertaining it's well, not that's just why it's not about it's, it's not about making something up mm -hmm. when i saw something i didn't like in tito i latched onto it man i mean i would just look at i would just and i would create genuine hate towards mm -hmm. what he looked like or what he said or what he was doing and i would genuinely hate it so it's not fake. Yeah. You're literally building this out of something real. You just have to find it. That's that's a crazy like character build. Yeah, but come on, that's Tito. <laughs> <laughs> it's not hard it wasn't hard, hard, bro. It wasn't. <laughs> Do you remember when they fought? <laughs> Do you remember yeah. when they fought? Yeah, I, I remember when they fought. Was the training camp crazy? Because yeah. you were helping Tito train, right? Up at yeah, Big Bear? I'm a or down here in HB? Yeah, training with Tito. We went to Big Bear sometime, but you know my memory's bad. I can't remember which camp was was what. But Tito, he used to train really hard. Oh, right. Yeah, Tito, Tito was one of the hardest training people I ever met until like, I started training with Michael Bisbee and yeah. other people. But I never seen anybody train really hard for, uh, for Tito. And Tito was worried about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Because... Um, he he knew how dangerous Ken was, like especially on the ground. Tito took him down because Ken was um, very dangerous on the ground, and they was he was really worried about his submission skills, and because he can submit you out of out of nowhere, he's really strong. So yeah, his training camp was was very tough. That's it. it's a uh, it's a unique correlation there too, because Tito is one of those guys who brought a little bit of that shamrock essence of style fighting too to the ufc he had really good wrestling he had really good striking he could stand there and bang and then you see that evolution in chuck who throws in kicks and because he had that karate style to him so it's cool how you keep seeing these generations kind of pass over into the next into the next flow during that era there was a lot of fighters that were on stuff and everybody's getting in trouble for being on something and it was there was you had some run-ins with some ped stuff and you were a phenomenal fighter people i don't think understand the way life works like <laughs> you can be on something you still got to train and work yes. hard i don't i don't understand yeah. how that works but there was it seems like everybody in the ufc was on something yes. right and everybody was doing it was like a free-for-all pre usada days do you feel like it was that way too i would love to hear like from your point of view from someone who actually fought and had to experience it well the thing that, that i think that bothered me the most What's wrong? was that why are you why are you why are you asking a legend about PEDs. No, just because I, I like no, because it. he's, like talk, it. he's talked like about it, it and yeah. I feel like he would give us a real fair shake. Yeah. And, I, and I'm not saying anything no one doesn't know. I'm no, saying, no, yeah, yeah. But, but the thing is, too, he's a legend. It, we know that it's 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 something that I think that's already been talked about. I, I yeah. never dodge this question. I've always taken it head on because it, it is a part of that generation. It, it was what everybody thought they needed to do in order to go in there and be in shape. So, but as time goes on, you start being educated on what does and does not work. Mm -hmm. And as you started going through, I would say mid nineties or late nineties, you started understanding that a lot of that stuff was a, was really bad for you, especially for hard cardio. And so they started doing more of the growth 
and the test more of that, that, that what your body already naturally produces and you give it a kick, a little bit of a kick, but you're not using a whole lot of it. So as your body recovers and you're getting stronger as you go through your training and you're not losing any cardio whatsoever. Mm. The thing that bothered me the most was that, you know, in the beginning when everybody was kind of doing whatever they were doing, I was always under a doctor's care. That's why I'm where I'm at now. I'm healthy. I have no issues. I have always done it the proper way. And uh, so, but what bothered me was that when they started to test and this, this, and this was around the time I fought Tito, uh, I believe the second time, I don't remember the exact time. And I remember cutting weight. I never cut weight before. I never had to because I fought at 215 or 218 and I was, it was good, right? I mean, you didn't have to worry. I could fight heavy or lighter guys. And it just felt great there. And then um, we had to, to cut weight my first time. And because this is now all of a sudden they were testing and I was like, okay, no problem. I can, you know, wasn't abusing anything. I said, no problem. So I started cutting. And I remember the day before weigh-ins, and Dan, Dan Freeman was one of my strength and conditioning coaches. I went from 218, 220 pounds down to 200 pounds. I'd never cut weight before, and I started to cut, and I crashed. I mean, I couldn't stop. And I was like, what's happening to me? And He's like, man, we got to get peanut butter and protein shakes. We just start piling it on. I think I weighed in at 201 or, or something stupid like that. I've never been that light before. And I remember looking at Tito and I'm looking, I'm going, he can't make weight. Like, how's he going to make weight? He walks on, he steps on, he's 205 or 206, something like that. And I was like, he looks big. <laughs> he looks bigger than what he is. And then... <laughs> The next day at the fight, I'm looking at him and he's twice as big as he was the night before we did weigh-ins. And I was like, that shit. And here I was just like thinking like, okay, because I, I never had any science or mm -hmm. anything to that. I just was from the streets and we just did what we did, right? And so here I'm cutting and thinking I'm doing the right thing. And I felt okay. I mean, I felt decent. But man, that was no match. I got in there and I grabbed and it was like a freaking tree trunk. And I'm like, okay. I need to go back to the drawing board because I need to figure out what the hell they're doing because that is not natural. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's a wrestler. Tito, <laughs> Tito was good at, at cutting weight. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah, he was, he was yeah, a wrestler. Big, wrestler. He's a big dude. He, he looked big because his head is big. He's, <laughs> well, he filled out too. I mean, he put yeah. on 10, 15 pounds after yeah. he cut weight. Yeah, Jesus. but his legs are small. Yeah. So he got tainted legs, but the rest of them, like up waist up, he's big and wide. Uh, oh, wow, uh, yeah. And that's why he looks bigger. He's a massive head. He, he's yeah. a big, probably one of the biggest 205s I've seen. I mean, yeah. He's tall. Just, yeah. yeah. He had to be 220 at fight time. Yeah. They uh, bigger now, man. Those 205s uh, or something, they yeah. bigger oh, now. Oh, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Oh, everybody's huge now. Oh, yeah. Did you, I saw um, Izzy oh. in, in person. Uh -huh. He's a, he's an 85er. He's bigger than me. Yeah. He's yeah. taller. Yeah, you see, look at Jalen Turner. Yeah. Our boy. Yeah, he's a 55er. Yeah, he cut like 25 pounds but, for his But bike. if you go back to the boxing and you go back to the Olympic wrestling, they all did it. Mm. They all do it. And it's just, see, normally if I if I was doing that and, and I was going into that competitiveness, I would be a 155er. Damn. You know what I mean? I mean, that's because, I mean, I walk around at a natural weight. I'm 205. Yeah. I mean, I'm normally a 205 pounder. Well, you'd be at least a 70 pounder. Yeah, but I'm saying, do you understand how yeah. much, like, how much weight these guys literally cut and then put on? It's, a, it's weird that they even allow that because yeah, they should. It's they, bro. They, you should you should weigh in like you know two or three hours before the fight. That way, it's your natural weight, so people can't. Or else, it's you're just like a weight bully. At well, that point. everybody, it's fair though. Yeah. I mean, if everybody's getting the same thing, it's just yeah. some people just diet are able to cut better. Like I was more well rounded. I needed water in my muscle because I had the round kind of bodybuilding looking. Uh, muscles and even though which was most people didn't realize until they actually fought me that I wasn't I could go two hours I didn't get tired my muscles didn't blow up I was that good a shape but most of the time people with my build their muscles get tight and full and they can't go 20 or 30 minutes mm. and I was just one of those freaks that could just go forever but majority of people had that my build cannot mm -mm. carry that much weight when they cut weight they get thin they lose power yeah, I mean, most guys that are big and jacked, they have no oxygen in their muscle. Their yeah. muscle needs more oxygen. It, well, they get tired. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you get the stringy guys that are tall and have that stringy muscle. Yeah. They're able to put a lot more weight on. Izzy, Jalen Turner, that style body shape, you know? Yeah. And they, they're 
also able to gain a lot more weight quicker, I feel yes. like, because they're already yeah, naturally. And you, and you know, if you do it wrong, once they retire, their body's going to bloom. Like me, or I, I gain a lot of weight because I was cutting weight and I was mm-hmm. putting weight on too fast after I, after I would, after my fights and stuff and your body just And it just does it. And then yeah. when you stop fighting, it keeps putting weight on. Yeah. <laughs> that's why people, that's why people, they, they always talk about people's like enzymes are crashing and yeah. they can't digest food. Their body doesn't know what to do. And yeah, yeah you throw your body out of whack for so long. It's never going to get adjusted. You got to go back to the doctor, back yes. to the drawing board. It's just like yes. me right now, man, I'm lean. I mean, oh, you like, look great. I still have yeah. abs. I still How old are you? Arms. I, I'm six. I'll be 60 in February, February 11th. 60 yeah. years old, and he looks like yeah. he would smash anybody in this gym right now. <laughs> well, I don't move like that, but yeah. <laughs> thank I, you. I, I asked him when he walked in, I said, yo, we got you a physical therapist, and I have a massage guy here. I know you just flew in for the podcast. Yeah. It's all set up for you. He goes, I got a metal ball here. I got a steel plate here. Ain't nobody touching my body. No, <laughs> yeah. I've got one through seven. I got metal brackets in my neck because wow. I broke my neck twice, once in high school when I was wrestling, and then, of course, after I had a career and it got all messed up. So then they put the brackets in there and then my lower back, I, f- I fractured the lower back, did some damage to it. So the one through three, there's brackets there and I have a titanium ball in my shoulder and then I've got my left knee has been replaced. So so you came into MMA with a broken neck already? Yes. Wow. Yeah. yeah. 17. That, 17. 17 that, that didn't play when, in your mind? See, yeah, I, I, that's crazy too because my my mentality, the way I grew up in the streets and all like that, Nothing ever, there was no no obstacles for me. It was like when I set my mind, I was going to do something. If I had gotten stabbed, which I did, I got stabbed in the arm, which I tried to stab me in the neck, put my arm up. This one, I was 10. Damn. Um, yeah. And uh, I would fight I, I, just because I got stabbed. I didn't stop mm. because when you grow up like that, it's, there's, 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 if you stop, you're dead. Right. I mean, like you got no choices but to keep going forward with what your goal is, whatever that goal may be, that happened to be win the fight or do what you need to do to get away, right? There's no stopping and going, hey, hold up, you stabbed me. They don't work like that, right? So when I got into the fighting part of it, that was easy for me, man. I wasn't getting jumped. I wasn't getting stabbed. I didn't have to worry about anybody shooting me or anything like that. That was, that was cake. And they were going to pay me to do it. I was getting arrested for doing stuff like that. So it was, I mean, again, like yeah. I said, the mentality part of that was, I think where I took the most advantage uh, yeah. of fighting was, it just didn't, didn't shake me at all. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I don't know how many people out there that really are true fight fans understand your, your background and your story as well. It's pretty inspiring. You and you and Frank grew up in a, in a group home, right? Yep. You guys aren't real brothers, your stepbrothers, right? Or like uh, foster brothers. Yeah. He came in, um, I want to say he was 10 years younger than me. I mean, he came in, I, I was in college playing ball. Uh, I had gone through the group home. Um, I ended up going to, uh, to, to play football and my dad called me and said, Hey, you got to meet this kid. And, uh, so I went, went home on a summer, summer break and Frank was there. I think he was 14 at the time. And, uh, he was kind of like me in a way where he didn't have any fear. He kind of went through some similar things I went through, locked in a closet and stepped there for days and, you know, forget he was there. Just horrible stuff. But as a kid growing up, it, it you either one, you, you break down and you, you become nothing or you, uh, you don't let those things affect you and you use them to your advantage uh, of being stronger, stronger minded. And, uh, so I remember when we were back on the, the, uh, uh, the visit and I was there and of course we have a big table is 20 plates uh, at this big table and we all sit and eat and after so over we all go into the living room and a lot of times we either box or we wrestle or we play around and I remember my my dad was always challenging me because I was a big strong kid I was fast I was a great athlete and he, so these kids were in there Frank and about four or five other kids and my dad says if you guys could take Ken down I'm standing right in the middle of the living room watching a game He goes, if you guys could take Ken to the ground and hold him there, I'll take you guys to Reno. And Reno is like only 84 miles up the road. And he's always taking kids because he had nice cars and stuff. And he'd take us and take us to Reno and give us some money and play. And so I just barely met Frank. And uh, Frank looks, goes and goes, heck yeah, let's go. Right. So he starts to charge in and I grab him by his hair and I shove him to the ground bam and I said the next one that comes near me I ain't gonna be so nice (laughs) they all just backed up and left him hanging but Frank was the only one that actually made the move and that's when I like okay this kid's got something (laughs) I love it and then did you guys become really close over the years because I know the age gaps there how did it I didn't I didn't come close to him because I was in college like I wasn't there I'd come home on visits and stuff and so I never really got to know him because during the time that he was there I think 
he was there maybe a year, year and a half. Um, he got himself into trouble. He met some girl, I think she got pregnant. I mean, there's a young, she's a sophomore or junior or something. And so him and her got into trouble. He stole some stuff from uh, this pharmacy or a store or whatever. He broke and breaking and entering. And so he ended up getting shipped away. Uh, but my father kept in touch with him all the time and uh, put money on the books. He went to prison, um, did, I think, three and a half years in prison uh, at 17. So he went in mm. at 17 uh, because he didn't want to do the, the teenage prison because those guys are always trying to prove themselves. He wanted to go straight into the big house. So he went in there. Wow. And I remember I had moved to North, uh, North Carolina at that time, and I was trying to get into the pro wrestling circuit. And my dad kept in touch with him. He kept saying, hey, I remember my, about Frank? And he says, I'm giving him books. I'm visiting him and different things like that. And so we end up moving back to California after he kept keeping in touch. I think three years later, go back there and Frank's getting out. And my dad asked, and this is when I started fighting and started building the, the fighter's house and all that. And he says, what do you think about Frank? And I was like, I mean, because I know my dad cared for him and was going there all the time. And I said, Pop, I said, as long as he's willing to come here and put the work in, I got no issue. I said, buddy, there's no favorites. And he's like, no, he doesn't need any, man. And so I remember Frank comes out. He gets out of prison. They bring him. And uh, wow. he's got, I kid you not, he's got hair all the way down to his ass. I mean, it's <laughs> long. And he's shredded. I mean, like he's just got this shredded body. Look really good, right? And I'm thinking to myself, you're either one badass or you were somebody's bitch because you <laughs> 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 and, oh, oh, oh my and, uh, god hey, he's right just getting out of jail good good thing, he it. was a badass right so yeah. we did a tryout with him and i tried everybody out right and even him i had to wow because i couldn't play any favorites and i think for a long time he felt that i didn't treat him fairly and i didn't i treated him harder no question because he was my brother because he was related i had to make it harder on him because of all the other guys that were there and i mean i put a beating on him and, uh, and he kept getting up. But the, the reason why that happened, and I don't think he knows this, but my father came to him and sa came to me and said, you have to make sure he knows who's in charge. And I was like, okay. My dad told me this. Wow. Right? Because Frank came out of there saying, I've been through a whole lot and ain't nothing I hadn't seen. Like mm. kind of like going into the tryouts, yeah. like very cocky. Mm -hmm. And I was like, and I, I was just going to just put him through the normal. But my dad says, dude, if you don't put the screws to him, you're going to have problems with them all the way through. And I was wow. like, okay, you, you know what you're asking. He said, yeah, but you need to do it. So I did. And I put a beating on him and I, and I, I heard him. I, I, I mean, I put a pretty good beating on him and I never went to him and said anything. My dad was the one to me and said, Hey, you know, you're going to have to put the work in now. Like you can't just be here and hang out and think you're just going to beat everybody. Cause it's a different level Yeah. because he literally thought he was just going to come in and, and just, you know, be this, the guy he was mm -hmm. where he was at. And so he came in and he literally put in the work, never complained one time. And he was one of the guys that learned the fastest. He picked up the fastest. And I think anybody that's ever watched him fight, he was probably one of the best fighters that have come out of the lion's den. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he was very talented. Doubt. Yeah. Very yeah. talented. Without a doubt. Won belts, did his thing. He, I mean, he, he won. A, I mean, he beat Tito. Yeah. I mean, like he taught. Tito didn't train the way he should have trained because I trained Frank and I trained all of them and they all took the training that I did. And they started implementing. Of course, they did their own little spins and whatever to it. But Tito didn't know how to train properly, do the right fights until he fought Frank. Frank literally, because he took it, Frank took an ass beating, you know, but Tito got tired in the fourth. And then in the fifth, he even got exhausted. And then Frank took over. And that was all because of the training that he did. And that's how Tito was able to learn how to train properly. Mm, unreal. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Unreal. And that's, and that's part of why Tito trained the way he did and trained so hard, especially when we went up to Big Bear, because I was I was like, I've never seen anybody train this hard. And I know my my training um turned around after after um I lost uh one of my first fights due to cardio. Yep. It, it just does does something to you. Did did you know that uh, when I fought Sakuraba I was supposed to fight you? No. Yeah. I was uh. so so um I was at Chris Brennan's gym and um I can't remember who, but someone offered me a, f a fight with you for uh, for five thousand dollars, and I was broke as fuck back then. <laughs> so I was like, "Fuck, fight Ken Shamrock." He's like, "Hell, I got he got to punch his chance." <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I was like, "For five thousand dollars, because you know, 
at that time, the most money I ever made was $500. Right. Yeah. You know Five thousand. It's like, brother, you got me cha-ching. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, okay, fuck it. I said, yeah. fuck it, I'll do it. Yeah. And then um, I started training for you. Like two days later, somebody came and said, fuck that, you fighting uh, soccer robber for $10,000. I was okay, fuck it. It don't matter to me, just pay me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, fuck yeah, let's do yeah. that. Hey, can you change it again? Keep up in it. Yeah. In Japan. In Japan. Uh, that was your first pride fight. My first, my first yeah, pride yeah, yeah. fight, I said, I, I said, I get to go to Japan right? and fucking $10,000 and I don't got to fight. And you do what you, and you're doing what you love doing. I, do, I mean, like, and I, didn't, I didn't want, I didn't want to fight you, but damn, I, I needed yeah, money. Yeah, I was uh, like, it don't matter when they put that in front of you, like yeah. you fight whoever, man. That's it. Yeah, huh? I was really, I was really young and, yeah. and green and we all looked up to him. Oh yeah. 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 We, we all, it's, it's like how, how fighters like probably looked up to Randy Couture like a couple right. years ago. Like yeah. it was ground he, zero basically. Yeah. yeah. Ground yeah. zero. Yeah, I mean, you are ground zero. I mean, you yeah. did it. You know, you guys are the original class. There's no class before you. Yeah. And you come from a class before that, too, overseas. Well, and I was know? a wrestler, too. I had a pretty strong background. Not like a lot of these guys, like Randy and, and some of these other guys, that like even Dan Severn, man, they, they there's some credentials there. Those, yeah. those guys were really, really qualified wrestlers and yeah. came in like Don Fry. I mean, those guys were beasts in the wrestling world. I, I, I because I broke my neck, I, I didn't get to really move on to do that. So I had to do something else. And did you ever fight Dunn me? Fry and and, oh, yeah. uh, and um, who was who was Dan Severn? You fought those guys. Uh, yes, I you know obviously destroyed Dan the first time I fought him. Second time was when we had the no punching. Um, that was that. The, that was the uh, the dance around. Uh, yeah, there was a yeah, yeah. the ring around the dance or something a, like that. It was, a, it was a, literally the worst fight in UFC history. To, even to this day, it's yeah. the worst fight. Oh, ever. this right because they the dance around the, 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 yeah. the open of the, fit, of like the an, state. Open okay, so yeah. I think just to be clear too, so the audience knows, it's actually an interesting story. Thanks yeah. for bringing that up. I yeah. think it was a couple hours before that the the state comes to you and they say you can fight Dan but you guys can't punch each other, right? And if you go to the ground, you can open slap, open palm, hit each other, no, right? you Something can't like hit. You oh, he was still doing hit. it though, but they didn't throw him in jail. Well, yeah. I Something mean, like that, right? Yeah, but it wasn't even about him. It was more about me because I had a group home for kids, right? And I was literally teaching kids, you know, stay within the rules. That's how I did it, right? Mm. I had anger and, and, and really bad, bad temper. And I was taught through my dad, like, hey, you can do whatever you want to do as long as you play within the rules. And I kind of, that's how I, that's how I was able to go from being this kid that was going to be dead before I was 18 or in prison to being actual relevant because I took these rule sets that I was told by my dad, Hey, go as hard as you want, hit as hard as you want, be as aggressive as you want, as long as it's within the rules. And I lived my life that way. And I started to become successful and relevant. And now all of a sudden I'm faced with dilemma where I'm the champion the whole world's watching me on this pay-per-view deal. And now I'm being told, go ahead and break the rules mm. because we're not going to do anything about it. But yet they're saying they're going to literally post. There is no, you cannot punch. It's against the rules. You can't do this is against the rules. And you're telling me when I have uh, six kids in this group home and we're teaching them these same kind of thing that I was taught to stay within the rules and you can accomplish whatever you want and you want me to throw that stuff completely out the window, which is everything that I, that I believe in. And you're telling me just to ignore those things. Yeah. And I couldn't do it. And uh, it ended up turning into a boring fight because there was no punching other than Dan hit me a couple of times. And then when I asked, uh, I asked, the, uh, I don't want to mention any names, but I asked him on the plane because I felt I was a champion. And I was like, how did he beat me? Like, cause neither one of us did anything. I was like, he should have stripped me of the title and then put it open for the next person to come up and fight for it because mm -hmm. neither one of us deserved it, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, well, he landed more punches. And I looked at him and I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, isn't that illegal? He goes, he goes come on, Ken. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, all right. Yeah, so it was illegal, it was illegal but, they, but they, was, <laughs> they was willing to turn a blind eye, but you didn't want to do that for the- They, for they the wanted the, the strap to go to, to, to Severn uh, because that was in Detroit, oh, hometown. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and- yeah, and it just, it, it's, you know, it's politics. You deal with it everywhere. So it's just one of those things during that time where it's like, you know, it was, it was something that I was not happy with. But if anything, man, it, it should have stripped both of us. It was yeah. a horrible fight. 
I, I had been, I, I know I had a meniscus tear, just some tissue, nothing serious, but it was, it, it was painful, right? It just affected my shots. And I also had a cracked rib at the time and I had broken nose because I was trying to do a knee bar on some big guy like, like Dan and the guy tried to kick out as I was pulling it back and he, his oh, shin yeah. hit me in the nose and blood was everywhere. And so that was probably two, two and a half weeks prior to that fight. So nose was really sore. So I was, I was banged up and I felt like, I'll just go in and submit him. I mean, that's my game. Severn's pretty weak at ground other than just trying to control people, but he has nothing on the ground. I'll just go for a leg lock and I'll finish him. If I don't finish him, at least I'll have a bunch of attempts and, yeah. you know, we'll see what goes from there. But then when they took away the actual striking and I thought to myself, it's like, how is that? Like, how do you fight like the way we fight without striking? Like, how does that work? And so... Sure enough, man. And and it, the hard part was was like, I believe it was two weekends prior to that, just over the bridge, because right there in Detroit, you go over the bridge, you're in Canada, right? Mm -hmm. And they just did a fight over the border there, and they literally, same thing, they told them the same thing, and they arrested them, the guys that, that, that did the striking. Uh, so it wasn't like it was a false thing that you heard they were going to do that. It literally happened two weekends prior to us doing this fight. And so I was just, I can't put myself in that position. Yeah, they was really trying to outlaw MMA and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, that was when they were fighting us. It was more of the boxing. It was the commission, but it's boxing, right? Yeah, so yeah. they were fighting hard to try to get it because they were getting crushed. Yeah. So, and then you see it now. It's like now it's just MMA. Boxing's kind of dead now. Yeah. Other than bare knuckle. <laughs> see, I was, yeah. Yeah, I was, worried about, I was worried about MMA becoming like PK. You remember PK yeah, kickboxing? Yeah, yeah. It, it was really big back in the, what, that? The 80s mm. and the 90s, the late 80s. Yeah, but then they put these big old pillows on them and these kick shin, shin pads on them. And it's like the only way you could really go see a great fight like that was K1. Yeah. And those were just, tr those are tremendous fights, man. Those guys were beasts. You was watching that when you was over in Japan? Oh, right yeah, there? man. Those guys were the real deal. Yeah. Do you spend a lot of time over there when you was over there training and stuff? Yeah, I was there. I actually lived over there six months. Did you did you ever learn some of the language? Oh yeah, Scotia, yeah, you know, li you know, just the ipai, you know, had had the things that get you around. I'm hungry, I'm full, yeah. <laughs> yeah. those things. <laughs> yeah, I bet, I bet you, I bet you was it was totally different when you was over there living in Japan. Yeah, did you yeah. love it? It was, uh, I did, man, and they were so respectful. Uh, it it. Uh, the funny thing is, when we first started going over there, you get into a taxi cab. It was normal, right? You'd get in and everybody sit there. Then after I was there for probably two, two, two and a half years, all of a sudden you started seeing these taxi drivers, taxi cab drivers, all of a sudden started putting shields up. <laughs> so, because oh, wow. everybody was flipping them in the ear or throwing stuff oh, at them, like when like, the Americans was going over there. Yes, and it, it happened a lot when we were there too. Uh, like a lot of the wrestlers and stuff, yeah. they would flip them in the ear. They were brutal. So then you started seeing these taxi cabs. All of a sudden, they had these the shields behind yeah. their seats. Nobody could touch them. Uh, <laughs> yeah. it's kinda, it's I would never do. I that wasn't something I did, but I think it was more of that pro wrestling circuit. Yeah. Those guys were brutal. I felt like I felt like when you first started going over there, it just wasn't a lot of Americans over yeah. there at the time. It wasn't. I mean, they were like, "Ooh and ah," you get on an elevator. It's like they hadn't seen anything before. It wasn't that many Africans. Because, you know, now there's a bunch of Africans yes. over there yeah. and something. It wasn't none of that, huh? No. You no. didn't see that many black it people was raw. Yeah. Yeah. I would, hey, I wish I would have been over there that time. I would have been raw, too. Raw <laughs> dog and every goddamn thing. Yeah. yeah, I love yeah, it. Yeah, man. It was oh, fun. I'm sure he knows some stories of you in Japan. No. Yeah. Oh, they've heard about you, know, you over there. You don't know about my circles. No. No? Uh -uh. No, no way he's heard about my circles. You, you hang out at the same clubs he used to go no. to? Here's he, the thing that was a little bit different for me um, was that because of my status, I didn't go out with the guys, mm. especially my team. I wanted them to be able to go out and let down, have fun, and without having somebody looking over the top of them. So I had to kind of stay Pretty back. Cool. And I did things on my own. And I, I knew people there because I had been there a lot longer than anybody else, and I had my own connections. And so I would hang out with different people from Japan. Yeah. Um, and it was more business. Um, but when I would go there, um, I wouldn't uh, – I, I wouldn't go with them. And I heard stories about things that my guys did. And it's like, if I was with them, they wouldn't have had that much fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I could imagine you and Rampage together. Uh, uh, he, probably, he probably would go to high class 
Oh yeah? yeah. Where do you go? Different places. Where do you go? If he goes to high class, then I where do you go? Wait, man. wait. If he goes here, then where are you I going? Was, I'd be in Rapungi. Rapungi. Yeah, oh, I know what's in Rapungi. Oh my god, I'd be bar hopping. A couple, a couple of nightclubs with some robots that do yeah, whatever man. you want. I go, I go to Shibuya first. I go look around, see what's up there. Then you go, but Rapungi is where you go with the girls. Yeah. If the girls there in Rapungi, they 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 pretty much cool with Gaijin with foreigners. Yeah. Because that's all it is. Like Gaijin means England, foreigner. Australia, yeah. everywhere yeah. from yeah. the world, they yeah. all, it's like a melting pot. They yeah. all go there. Yeah. And we're all Gaijin. We're yeah. all Gaijins. You yeah. got that from Fast and the Furious. No. That's what they call I the got, white kid no. in Fast and that's the Furious. That's what they got that because that's what they call it. That's what they call it. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like you're really uh, comfortable and excited always, like when you talk about the past and MMA and your fights and your history. It seems like you're like not at peace, like anything was wrong, but you loved it. Like you still love it. And there's no, like, uh, I don't want to say, regrets but it just seems like you talk so freely and i can feel the spirit and the energy like you love talking about it do you do you have regrets at all it seems like everything you've talked about like you just loved the way your career has kind of progressed over the years you know it well, feels that way i think everybody has regrets when they look back on it but man i think that you know if you've if if you're if you're picking apart things and there are just very few things in between that yeah. you would pick at uh, to have those regrets, right? So I think on a whole, when you look at it on a whole, man, you've been blessed to, to be able to have that kind of journey. And so I know sometimes when people go, well, what about this thing with you and Dana or this thing that happened in the WWF? And, and, I, and when they pinpoint those things, I talk about them, right? But that's no different than life we live, right? Yeah. I mean, life, you go through life, man, you hope there's more things that were enjoyable in life than they were that weren't. Mm -hmm. And so when someone literally picks at something and goes, hey, what about this? Sure, you talk about it. But man, you wouldn't have gotten where you were at and had all the good things happening to you if you hadn't gone through a few of those down things. Yeah. So I, I don't, I just look at everything that I was I was a part of and the opportunities that I had as a blessing, mm -hmm. um, good and bad. Yeah, it's yeah, great. Brother, he's one of the pioneers of the sport, like in like the whole sport of MMA. All the fighters, we all respect respect him. I don't know about the newer guys coming in. I feel like more of the newer guys, they're probably like fans mm -hmm. of the new the newer age and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But pretty much my generation, like the ones like they're pioneers to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we all look up to them. We salute. We salute. Yeah, them. you've never been one to shy away from showing respect to the ones that deserve it the most. So it's always amazing to see that because it sets the tone for the audience and people to understand that you have to show the display of honor and the display of respect when you have guys like this in, yeah. in the room and in, in life. You know, it's yeah. truly. I, I feel. Truly. I feel bad like when the newer guys. They get upset that I don't know them, right. but the you guys, you guys are my heroes. Yeah, like the ones that yeah. came before me. Like it's just, yeah. it's just different. Like, no, it know. makes sense. One of my favorite fights that I watched of you. There's actually a few, but one that I thought like, oh, this guy's about to win, and I, I don't, I honestly, I think. I was with you at Dave and Buster's, but I don't, I don't want to quote this, but it was when you fought Kimbo Slice yeah, yeah, in yeah. Bellator. Yeah. And I think I was with you at Dave and Buster's. I don't remember. I don't remember, remember why I watched that fight. Yeah. But I do remember that like you were choking this guy out and I'm like, oh, it's over. This guy hasn't lost a step. He's, he's a little bit older, but he's so strong. And like, I'm looking at Kimbo, you know, and you, when you're a kid, you don't realize that muscles don't mean a guy knows how to fight. Right. So <laughs> right. I saw Kimbo and I saw you and you had the Wolverine thing kind of going on here right. with the a facial hair. I go, Oh man, he's got to fight this monster. I go, damn, dude, there goes Shamrock, you know? But <laughs> it seemed like you were just out muscling this guy and your wrestling was insane. You was and like then, 50, wasn't you? Yeah. Uh, I was, I felt so good. Mm. I felt like I was going to destroy him. I really did. I just, there was just no way he was going to beat me. No way. And I remember taking him down and I had already had everything planned. And it went ex almost exactly the way I thought it was going to, other than me getting hit. But when I took him down, a double shot, knew I was going to dump him. I knew he was going to roll to his belly. I put the choke on. I knew he was going to tap. Problem is, he didn't tap. So if you watch that fight, I slip in my choke and I'm working him. And then I push it in and I go in and he reaches out. I kid you not, he does this and then does this. Like nothing big or nothing large. And so, which is not me uh, in the... The original Ken Sham, I'd have destroyed him and I'd have kept holding on to it until they pulled me off. Mm -hmm. But it was just something where I had reached a point where I wanted more respect. I wanted to leave with respect. I wanted to be able to have the courtesy of being able to choke him out, shake his hand, not, not be disgruntled, even all the stuff that we were talking. Try to be that polite guy. So I let go of him. 
I literally just eased up on him and because I felt like he tapped. And I remember going, okay, I'm waiting for John to touch me and it's over. Because, I mean, he was done. I mean, it was over. And he even said in the press conference, he went out. And that's the part where I felt him go limp. And I was like, okay, it's done. Well, all of a sudden, he pops up and I slide off. And, of course, I ain't moving that good. That's why when I had him down, I wasn't going to let him go because there's no way I'm going standing up very fast because my knees were shot. So Damn. I'm holding on, and all of a sudden he pops up, and I'm like, oh, shit, it's not over. <laughs> and so I go to get up, and I'm, he's much faster than I was, and he hits me with the shot. Even when he hits me with the shot, I feel it, and I'm like, I'm okay. Like, there was nothing wrong with me. I mean, he hit me hard, too, but I gotta, I've never been knocked out, ever. I've always been got hit, and I'm okay. So I remember when he hit me, I'm like, okay. And all of a sudden he steps in and stops it, and I'm like, what are you doing? It's like... I'm, I'm, what are you doing? And they give me a chair to sit in and I'm like, what are you doing? And they, they stopped the fight and I'm thinking to myself, why did you stop the fight? Then I watched the replay and I was like, oh, <laughs> that was a good shot. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. But you don't know R it when R you're R in there, Kimba, right? Huh? Yeah, yeah, you don't know it when you're in there. You're yeah, like, yeah, I yeah. mean, in my head, I was like, dude, I'm okay. Yeah. But once I watched the replay, I was like, okay, now I get it. Yeah, you lose a couple of seconds <laughs> yeah, sometimes. Yeah, you, you just think you're you're fine. And, yeah. and, and if because I never really made it to my feet, I never really got to my feet. I yeah. got to my knees. Mm. And in my head, I'm fine. But when they sat me on the chair, yeah. I thought I was fine. But when he hit me, I was like, well, that was. Yeah. Dude, my, <laughs> that my was... last time getting knocked out, a female, a female, I think she was like the corner. I don't know what she was, like a ref or something. She wasn't our ref. She coming in the ring. I'm like, oh my God. Like, no, no. <laughs> I just remember telling her, no, don't stop the fight. But she was already stopped the fight. I was already yeah. knocked out. Yeah, yeah. You just you don't, don't, you lose, yeah, yeah. No, you lose I almost, just, I almost fell asleep over here yeah. with Vincente Luque. He was putting in that reverse darts. Yeah. You lose track of time. Yeah, well, and it, and, you, and you're because you're so set on fighting, and and, and in that particular fight, there's no way I was losing, right? Yeah. I and mean, I was like, this fight's over, yeah. even before it started. And then when I took him down, everything went that way. I was like, it's over. Yeah. So yeah. in my head, the fight was over already. Yeah. I just didn't yeah. realize it was over for me. Yeah. <laughs> I know you regret yeah. letting that go. I loved watching yeah. Kimbo's videos. I loved everything Kimbo did. I thought he was so awesome. I loved him on the show. Yeah, like I good. thought Kimbo Slice was one of the coolest dudes yeah. ever. And like obviously him transitioning into MMA and UFC and Bellator and whatnot, like a lot of people don't really talk about him too much nowadays. We see videos of him, but he was an originator of that backyard brawl, Masvidal style yeah. fighter, you know, RIP to Kimbo Slice, a phenomenal dude. But did you, uh, did you respect him as a fighter though? Not a person, but like as a fighter, did you be like, Oh, let me look at this guy in world star and see what's going on here. Like, did you think he actually could do damage to you? Yeah, no, absolutely not. I mean, obviously. And even at that age you know i was i just felt like he was so one-dimensional and that still at that age have, huh? he didn't have a balance wow. and it was true everything i did all the way up until he hit me yeah uh it was it, it was true like yeah. i literally had complete control over him um but again with him i think the thing that that i respected most about him was that where he came from because i know where i came from mm -hmm. and i know how hard it is right to get respect and know how hard it is to get to a position to where you feel like you're relevant now. And uh, I think that he kind of traveled those same roads. And I think he was finally getting to a place to where he was, he could pull himself out of that, that world that he, he was forced to be in at that moment, like literally to be able to make a living, be able to have some status. Yeah. And he's getting into this world of fighting and he, and no matter what anybody says, whether his, his, his credibility of his fighting or not, his name and his ability put him in a position to where everybody was talking about him mm -hmm. period. So you, whether you believed he had the style to be a world champion, whether you believed he had the credibility to be a world champion, none of that mattered because he was the talk of the town. He literally did what he needed to do when he had those fights, including myself, was able to win those fights no matter how he did it. He won those fights. So it was sad to see somebody who had come so far and have his life cut short when he was just getting to a point to where he was getting the respect he deserved. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah, I, yeah. absolutely. The respect to, to Kimbo, you know, I coached him on that Ultimate Fighter. I just wish that he would have just put in more time to learn the ground game. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't know, I don't know why he didn't, didn't put in the time to learn the ground game, you know, respect to him and his son, baby slice. My son trained with his son and he's a, he's a, he's a great kid, you know, yeah. so he's a good fighter. And so I'm, I'm not talking bad about your dad. I just, you know, as a, as, as his former coach, 
I was just wondering why he wouldn't put in more time to learn the ground game because you know he was a he was a good puncher and you know he was he was already explosive, right? explosive. Yeah. He was an athlete for yeah. sure. Great athlete. He, he had like great athleticism to him as a fighter, and people nowadays don't see much of that. They see the slickness in the Masvidal, and they see the, the 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 wittiness of a fighter, right? That like that cunning look to look at a fighter and kind of be able to bob and weave. But the power and the ferociousness he had yeah. as a backyard brawler to then watch him well, in the ring was awesome. His character was was bigger than anything yeah. else he had. His yeah. character and and how he he came across to people, man, and then to be able to go in there and actually have some success. Yeah, man. Uh, you just look at him and you're going, man, he made the most out of everything he had. Because again, like I said, his skill sets were not that great, right? Yeah. right. But with the ones he did have, he made the most of it. That's, yeah. that's and you fought him a heavyweight, right? That was heavyweight you fought him in, right? Yeah. 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 He, was a, he, he was a big guy. Like I saw him in the gym. He just didn't, I felt like I was bigger than him, but yeah. he weighed more than me. He was just a big, he was just like a he big, was heavy, yeah, heavy. He was, yeah. he was just big. dense and, and like not wide, but like, like, I don't know well, what the I, word why, is. Why, why you why you describe him like this and why did why you? Well, because you were about <laughs> no, to say no, you no, liked no, his no, size because you no, went like no, this, no, like you used no, to I, touch no, him. No, I was talking about the chest. Yeah, and how big it was. But you saw him then kid. He was like, well, he was this. And I didn't no, know, because I didn't he was know this way. I didn't, I didn't know you knew Kimbo like that. Hey, no, because like if this is like, hey, hey, yo, you know what I mean? Like that, not like that. How you talk about it? No, no, no. I just meant like his chest and his body, his abs, the This guy's crazy. You got you. Guys, Shamrock over here laughing at me, thinking I'm talking about Kimbo. Hey, hey you was described the man Kimbo, like Either that. way, I made you look good. So, <laughs> it's all good, but yeah, bro. Either way, we got you, Kimbo. Did you, did you ever fight? Um, Tony Ferguson. Tank Abbott. Never. No. He was. He was. A, he was a. But there was no weight classes back then. Though. None. Yeah. But the yeah. times yeah. I was supposed to fight him, um, he was. He fought um, Oleg mm. in, in the finals when they did the tournament, and the winner of that was going to fight me. Mm. And then, of course, Oleg beat him, so I ended up. You know, mashing yeah. holy to to no end, and I that, that was brutal because I I knew trying to submit him, he wasn't going to tap, and he mm. was on our team, and he was going to go to Japan, so he was a business for me, right? So I was trying to knock him out, and that guy had a rock for a head, but I literally beat the stuffings out of him, <laughs> and because all because I didn't want to try to submit him because I knew he wouldn't tap, and if I broke his leg, mm. because I'd fought I'd done him in in in, in practice and just you know just destroyed him yeah. of course, but I never had to finish the actual submission I'd let it go mm. because I know he wouldn't tap that was his mentality and I was like I'm not going to break his leg because he's my guy so uh, <laughs> I just ended up punching him and thinking I would knock him out I literally had him on the ground when I'm like kid you not I had him on the ground and I'm punching him and I hit him with a shot and it was right on his chin. I was like, and his head was on the ground and you hear this thump and I was like, boom and his eyes rolled back in his head and I was, I was thinking to myself, okay, he's out. And I was like, oh, I'm going to hit him again just to make sure. And I hit him again. <laughs> you and, wake him back and he up. he woke up. <laughs> I said he just left him alone. <laughs> Unreal. <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay, he's Unreal. done. <laughs> as, as, as we go to wrap this up, you know, first of all, I want to say that I think the, the impact you had on, on the game and where we're at in today in terms of MMA is like phenomenal by far. And, you know, we're honored to have you here. It's always a... A blessing to have guys like you in the studio to kind of just chop it up about these stories like that's what we're trying to do here we're just trying to have good conversation about the sport the game combat sports mixed martial arts all of it under one tree one umbrella one thing i look at now like i i love to talk to rampage about the current fighters i feel like since we started doing this podcast like you kind of fell back in love with the game a little bit you're yeah. watching fights i'm watching talk about now. a lot of the yeah. younger guys do you still watch a lot of UFC? You still follow fighters specifically, like in the UFC? I don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Simple. Uh, yeah. uh, and it's not. It's not because they're not good. Because yeah. they are. They're tremendous. It's just that because I'm not. I'm not a part of it. It's hard um, when, especially as you have a family. You know, I got kids. I got grandkids. I got seven kids. You know, they're grown up. I've got seventeen grandbabies. I got a business that I'm doing, you know, with, with bare knuckle. Uh, there's so many things that I'm involved with right now. And obviously I pay attention through social media platforms. I have Facebook, uh, different things when fights happen, mm -hmm. but to sit and watch it at home, there's no way I could donate that much time to sit and watch a fight when I'm at home. Mm -hmm. I just have so much going on. I'll never be able to sit. I can't sit for two hours. I, I just, it's just not me. Would and then even if Conor I McGregor? did, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep. Would you, I couldn't sleep. Would you watch Conor McGregor fight? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, and listen, um, 
there's there's a lot of things that happen with fighters. Uh, you know, you, you you see it with Jones, John Jones. You see it with Conor McGregor. You know, I I kind of had that a little bit, right? Whereas we push the envelope because because that's our character. It, it's 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 not enough just to fight, right? It's we want to make sure that everybody knows we're coming, and so we talk that trash, not necessarily. Uh, in a sense of of trying to demeanor anybody, but just to kind of like give people a reason to watch and make it more exciting. And for me, it was more about preparing to get into the fight because when I was fighting somebody, I wanted to not like them. I, I just didn't want to like them. Mm -hmm. And then after it was over, we'd be good. But I just had to have a reason not to like them. And so that's why those things would happen. I don't know what their reasons are. But there was always a line that I, I felt was you can't cross. And you know, even like Tito, where there's a few things that he did that caused me to really get upset because he crossed the line with certain things that he did. And those I always felt there was just a certain thing that you did, and then there was things you didn't do when it came to family, girlfriends, wives, uh, anything other than the fight, um, things that you wow. just don't do. Yeah. And I think that when you see what these guys do today – um, not necessarily all of them, but like even with Connor and, and John Jones, they take it outside the ring mm -hmm. and they get themselves into these situations that everybody sees it and it's not a good look for us. And I think that it's not them, their responsibility, even though it is, uh, but they're going to make mistakes, but it's up to the organization to hold them accountable mm -hmm. so that other people don't come in behind them and do the same things and think that there's no punishment. Because that's what's happening with the standards that's being set with guys like Conor McGregor and also John Jones. And there's others out there, too. It's not necessarily them. They're high strong. They have their, their elevators that go to certain places. But they need role models or people there that are going to say, you can't do that. And hold them to that and hold them responsible. <clears throat> because otherwise... Nobody's going to pay attention to the rules. You think um, the UFC should put a um, fine in place for con con conduct clause in the contracts? Like if they fuck up, like John Jones and, and Conor been fucking up in the, in you know outside, just fine them for like twenty percent of their last purse or something like that. Yeah, and I think they should be suspended. I mean, there's got to wow. be. And again, nothing against these guys because they're great fighters. I love them and I, I love the annex. But there's got to be boundaries that the organization sets and holds to, and you cannot waver from them because you're setting a standard for everybody else coming in behind them. Mm -hmm. I kind of agree with them a little bit, but think, <laughs> think about the day. I agree with them. They should, it should be something for the conduct, but the suspension say, say if Conor McGregor goes out and throw another motherfucking dolly at a bus, right, and then, right. then he, then he got a fight coming up. Yeah. That promotes his fight. So they know that stuff. They won't suspend yeah, him. He, he was walking out of jail the next day in a brand new suit, ready to rock. Yeah, I'm good. And and, and they got everybody interested in his fight. So yeah. I understand what I'm saying suspend him. Yeah, that's that's good. But then that'll promote his fight if yeah. he had to fight. But him. but if you don't do that, next time that happens, somebody ends up dying. Yeah, because yeah. that thing goes through the window and takes somebody's head off. Yeah, because they didn't set that standard of going. We ain't this. This is not happening. Mm -hmm. I don't care who you are. Mm -hmm. This is not a Mike Tyson syndrome. You're not going to do this. I mean, they, they ham. So what's different with Mike Tyson? They hammered Mike. I mean, when he did something wrong, they drilled this guy. He went to prison. He was innocent too. Uh, but you hear what I'm saying? It's like saying, yeah. standards got to be set. Yeah. You got to hold to them as yeah. an organization or, or it's yeah. going to continue to get worse because they don't believe that you're going to do anything about it. Yeah, do, do you have a good relationship with Dana White? I think so. I mean, I, I don't have any issues with him, and I think he's done. <laughs> the dude is a genius. I yeah, mean, he's done a tremendous yeah. job. Where they brought phenomenal, him. but you know, obviously, as as somebody that's in the mix of that, you're never always going to agree with what they're doing or yeah. what they're saying, or even some of the issues that we've had. But that's, that's just human nature, right? But as a person, the guy's done a tremendous thing for for mixed martial arts. Oh yeah, I you mean, have he, to agree. He with, took you it to the next that. level. It's one of the greatest commissioner league owners of all time. Absolutely, absolutely. But, but have you heard? Have you heard what he's worth though? How much? I don't know, man. I don't know. How, you never know how true it is and stuff like that. But I was watching something on on TikTok. I always watch TikTok on board. <laughs> and they was comparing Dana White's uh, 
net worth to like other celebrities and stuff like that. And he's he's up there like over five hundred million. Yeah, oh, he's probably he's, worth he's a couple worth billion. More than that. Yeah. yeah, he's probably worth a couple yeah. billion. No he's, way, he's, no yeah, way, yeah, a couple yeah. billion. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent, bro. If the if the com- the company right now, from my understanding, is got to be ten billion. They just did they just did a five billion dollar ten year deal at Netflix for WWF WWE right with TKO Holdings. Yeah. They have Power Slap. They have Rumble. They have all these things so they if, own. So if the company's worth ten billion, he oh, he he's he, he got ten percent. Yeah, he got at least a billion. Yeah, at least yeah, a billion. He, 10, he, 10% and he's right. and he deserves. It. I mean, this guy yeah. has literally he probably owns been half of Vegas face. at this point. Yeah, you know? well, yeah. he walks in anywhere yeah. and he's car blanche. So, yeah. what do you mean? Yeah, yeah, anywhere yeah. and anything he needs. What about your your league? Before we wrap up, yeah. I want to hear about your your bare knuckle league. Is this? Did you start this out of out of nowhere? Did you jump in on something? Is, is it because you have a passion for fighting still? You still training? Break this down for me. Yeah, you know, because I love fighting, I just never never wanted to leave it. And obviously, you get old and you just realize you just you can't keep doing it, right? <laughs> so, in order for me to stay involved in something I love to do, I felt like okay, let me let me let me stay on the outside of of this and and do something different. And if I, and I remember saying to myself, if I was going to get involved with being a promoter, I wasn't just going to be, I was going to be an owner. Mm. And I wanted to, to, to not just do something and follow suit and do what everybody else is doing. If I was going to do something, I wanted to be something that's going to change the game. I want it to be different and be creative. And so the first thing I did was started thinking about the things that I had done as a fighter and what people wanted to see. And I remember early on, and you you know this very very well, is early on when 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 we first started doing this, the, the crowd would always start chanting, "Stand them up, stand them up," because mm. it was so hard to digest everything that was happening in the clinch and on the ground. It's hard to see all the little things going on. And I thought to myself, I want to keep it simple, even though it's something that I was very good at. I want to cut out that grappling, and I want to just keep them on their feet. And I was a big boxing fan before I was ever caught up into the mixed martial arts stuff and watching Hagler and Duran and uh, Sugar Ray Leonard. I mean, just some great fights and and Holmes and Hagler. Uh, I thought to myself, boxing is dying right now. And they just took it off Showtime. They just shut down on Showtime. So there's no more Showtime boxing. But yet that fan base is still out there. And they're being, this MMA is being shoved down their throats. And I thought... Let's bring back boxing. And so I thought to myself, how do I make boxing more exciting? Mm. And I thought, okay, um, let's take down the ropes and the cages because the worst thing when you go to a fight is not being able to see the fight. It's always something in the way. And not I've never not, as a fighter, had to be told to stay in and fight. It's like, that's never been an issue of ropes and cages of keeping me in there to fight or anybody else. And so I was like, just take them down. The visibility would be different for people sitting in the front row. Uh, visibility for in the stands, it's just open. And just slant it, bring it in a pit. So we did that. And I thought that the next thing, especially me as a fighter, worst thing for me was when I get in the middle of a punch combination, the guy would cl- just grab me, like keep me from really knocking them out or, or having an advantage over them. They just grab you like they did Mike Tyson. When guys would start doing a two, two or three punch combo and he would go to counter, they grab him and keep him from fighting. I thought to myself, Take out the clinching, no clinching. Mm-hmm. And so with those two things of being able to do the bare knuckle with true bare knuckle, no tape, no nothing, is to be able to make the fights more exciting so that it compares or competes with mixed martial arts. Mm-hmm. So when we did our first event, it was unbelievable. Wow, the fights I'm, I'm, show, I'm showing so him the, fast, the, the, the ring. I'm showing him the ring. Yeah. yeah. I'm in, so yeah. I'm in. It was so fast, man. None of the fights got out of the first round. Um, it was true bare knuckle. There was no tape on the hands whatsoever. Yeah. Just it looked phenomenal. It no, looked phenomenal. No tape at all? Yeah. None. Nothing. Zero. And the ring looks phenomenal. The stadium yes. looked phenomenal. You did such a great job. You, yeah. You're in your, your silver the to- uh, yeah. vest yeah. and your yeah, red shirt. All ready to go. Ready to rock. What's the name of your show? Valor. Valor, right? Yep. V-A-L. Yeah. Valor. Valor Bare Knuckle. Did you get that from Valley Dudo at all? Any no, I got there? it from actually the military, the Valor. Nice. Yeah, nice. with the honor, integrity. Nice. I love I love the name. When I heard the name, I was like, wow, that's cool. Yeah. Did you sell out your first show? Yes. Wow. Yeah, and not, 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 Where not, was it? It was it was in um, uh, South Dakota. Nice. South Dakota. Yeah, the casino. Yeah. So, and that's what I was down in Miami last that's week. Unbelievable. Doing, is we're yeah, you guys, you guys, you, this is something... I feel like with boxing and everything going on, like doing exhibitions and having these one-off fights at these fights would be something that would be phenomenal because the thing that I think everybody is missing right now in media, not to go off 
tangent here, but like people want to watch content. They want to watch things that are easy to digest. Yep. They don't want things that are constantly being sold to them over and over again, waiting one year for a fight. They just want to watch fights. Yep. Fight fans want to watch fights. And, and they I want think, finishes. Yeah, I think you do a great job at yep. keeping the, the visibility. That was my favorite thing. Yep. And I wanted to congratulate you on that because yep. what an iconic move to just make it open. Because now if I'm sitting courtside at your game, you know, no pun intended right there, I'm watching the fight in front of me with no ropes, no boundaries, no corner tape, no corners. It's is, so awesome. Is it on the floor? Yeah, like, well, so it's, they can't it's fall probably out? about this high. No, it's raised up like four feet. But so they can't fall off, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but we we have a, like, say this is bigger, right? And mm. then on the edges, it slants up. Mm. So when it's really soft, so when they get to the edge, they sink down into it when they uh, go to step. So yeah. they know they're not to go back. You can't, you can't, right? When uh, you hit it, you know you, you got no footing, right? Uh, so you got to get back on the surface. So, so. Unbelievable job. Yeah. Congrats. We should, go, we should go to Oh, I'm down. When's yeah, your next show? We're uh, April, May. Where's we're, it at? We're, uh, well, right now we've got a couple of venues we're talking to. I was just in Miami um, and we were working through that. So some exciting stuff coming. Right now, though, we're restructuring because we had to make some changes within our structure of business. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think probably maybe April or May, we're hoping we can get something done by then. That'd be awesome. But, um, Let's go. We, yeah, this is, this is, this is game changing, man. He, he just got a contract today to, for a huge fight in the Middle East oh, right. uh, yeah. for his first boxing fight. Dude, yeah. I'm telling you though, if you're still fighting, you should look at this because when it's bare knuckle, man, one thing that you know is that if you land a punch, it counts with gloves on. A lot of times you may land a real good shot, but because it's got padding on it, the guy doesn't go down. Yeah. I'm, I, I, I'm scared of hurting my fist. That's why I've never thought about doing. Uh, uh, yeah. That's, that's a thing too. Like you, you gotta be more accurate, not powerful, but yeah. accurate. You could do his and just with one boxing glove. <laughs> yeah. See that? Did yeah. That. Yeah. What's going on with that? You got the same oh, thing as yeah. Shannon Briggs. Yeah. yeah. Like, what actually, is that? that was from Brian Johnson. When I fought Brian Johnson, and it broke. That's the Muay Thai guy, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, big old, yeah. big dude, man. Yeah. Huge. He ended Huge up guy. breaking my hand, and I had to pin him against Vince, and I punched, finished him with the other one. Yeah. <laughs> before we before we wrap up here, um, I know it's been a long show, but you have never been one to stray away from anybody. You fought everybody. Your your career was illustrious. You fought big dudes. You were iconic with the style, uh, the mixed martial art you brought, like we've been saying the whole time. Just phenomenal. Groundbreaking, pioneering. Any other word you could figure you could throw in there. You know, mm -hmm. it's unbelievable what you did. And I do want to make sure that the audience gets that respect. We have a lot of the new fight fans and they, they need to know the history. Overall, though, would you say that pro wrestling, WWE, WWF, that style of wrestling took a bigger toll on your body over MMA or was it MMA over pro wrestling? Well, it, it was definitely pro wrestling because I was good at, at MMA. I, I, you know, early on, I was taking guys down and submitting them within a minute and a half, two minutes, three minutes. I didn't take the punishment. My punishment came in training. Um, but when I got into pro wrestling, uh, you had to give your body to your opponent and they had to take care of you. And a lot of times, man, like especially being the WWF, uh, we would be out on the road for three weeks, home for four days, back out for two weeks, home for five days, back out for three. So we were constantly putting on shows. So you're talking probably 200 days a year you're doing an event, 200. And that's how many times your body is getting slammed, kicked, punched, and hit. Whether it's entertainment or not, you're still God. taking those bumps. I can't it's not imagine. Worth it. I can imagine. It's it a lot, man. It's a lot. And my body just got beat, especially when I came back to do MMA. Boy, I could tell I, 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 I took a lot more punishment than I thought. Wow. Yeah. And who is your favorite working with in the wrestling in the wrestling world? Got to be The Rock, man. Wow. You work yeah. with The Rock? Oh, yeah. Me and Rock went toe to toe so many different times, man. We Yeah, we did the uh, King of the Ring. I beat him for the actual King of the Ring title. And then um, we had many matches for the Intercontinental title. Um, yeah, we went on for almost a year and a half where mm. we did a program together and we were working. He's a cool every, dude. Oh, yeah. One of the best. Really? Yeah, one of the best. I heard, a, I heard a lot of guys were scared to wrestle you, though, because you was hurting people. <laughs> yeah. Is that true? That's were you not, hurting people? No, is, I'm telling you what is, I heard. Yeah, I'm going to tell you what I heard. Hey, is it that true is that you true. got in a I'm fight backstage at a WWF event and no. you beat up one of the wrestlers? That is not true. Right, we heard a lot of these rooms. Okay, wait, you know yeah. I did TNA. You know I did TNA. Yeah, you did TNA. Yeah, yeah. So I heard yeah, people scared to wrestle you. Listen, you don't have to say yes or no if it is true, so don't worry. I'm not putting you under Blink twice if it's true. Blink twice if it's true. I just want to ask you a few of these rumors. Number one, and we know you're a legend, so we're Respectfully, number one, I heard that one time you had a you had an altercation with Vince McMahon, and then they they brought in extra wrestlers when they had to come talk to you in the locker room. Is that true? That's not true at all. <laughs> at all. 
at all? That's not okay. true. Okay. Num- number two, that's good. Number all two, right. I heard that you is. I just want to make sure it's not true that you beat up one of the wrestlers that was pissing you off backstage and no one did anything. They let you do your thing. Is that that's true? Not, not true. true. And then number three is I heard that a lot of people didn't want to work with you because if they did a little too much to you, you, you kind of clinch them up a little bit in there and they couldn't do anything and they hated it. They would get hurt. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that might be true. Yeah, that might be true. That might be true. That might be true. That was but, true. Yeah, that you guys tell us if it's true. Come yeah. on, give it's, us the story. I'm going to tell you this it's a right now. truth somewhere in that yeah, one. Yeah. No, there's. It, it, it's silly because there's <laughs> no way I would have had the career that I had yeah. with guys like Shawn Michaels. The Undertaker, Bret Hart, Stone Cold, you name it. The guys I worked with would not have worked with me. Uh, they had a choice to work true. with me. That yeah, is a great Every point. single yeah, yeah. one of those guys that were superstars all could not wait to work with me. And and, and anybody that was stiff like that or, or had a problem or they thought might do something and hurt them, they wouldn't. Take the time of day to do a match with them. Uh, I promise you, that is the truth. So how does it work? So they can, if Vixen Man or whoever, they write the story and say, all right, you got to you gotta wrestle with Shamrock. They say, no, I'm not wrestling him. Or they can or they There's can say no yes. way anybody would do that because- They can say yes. They can yeah, say no. Abs- well, they could say no, choose, but right. because of the status that I had as a, a mixed martial artist fighter, every single one of those guys- just couldn't wait to work with me. I mean, you're looking at a guy that was the world's most dangerous man. Beat, I was a world champion in mixed martial arts. These guys are pro wrestlers. This gives them credibility when they work with me. They literally get in the ring with me and now they're legit. So that's why it doesn't make sense when you hear these things. These oh, are yeah. guys that are just, rumors. these mm-hmm. are guys that are just talking smack oh, okay. and, and just want to try to give yeah. me a bad name. But no, no, you talked to no, 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 this wasn't a bad name. No, it wasn't, wasn't a fun, a, uh, yeah, it wasn't yeah, a fun, like yeah. you were the big dog there. I was, yeah. but yeah. every one yeah, of those okay. guys, yeah. but, but every one of those guys wanted to work with me because they're, because one, they're a pro wrestler and working with me gives them a different status. Yeah, yeah. No, this was all from a place of you just being being him. Yeah, yeah, yeah being and, the big and, dog. And yeah. It was, and, yeah. and, and, but that's all the more reason why those guys would want to work with me. But you wasn't hurting people. And so absolutely you, you not. Kicking and nobody's it, ass and it in it the did, locker room. The only one I ever either tatered, and that was one of my first matches, was Vader. And I, I broke his nose. <laughs> but he never complained one freaking time. Why'd you break his nose? We, we were doing a match him. and I oh, need him and he went accident. down. Oh, and, he, okay. and, he, and he hit me with a hard shot and I went down and we had a great match. Did he hit you with a hard shot first then his nose broke? No, I hit him with the tater first. They hit him with a hard shot. They got in a fight. Yeah, that yeah. sounds like you were a little pissed. Yeah. And I didn't know it because I sparred and I did all that. That was normal for me, right? Yeah. I was like, I thought we had a great, we did. Uh, yeah. But, it, it, you know, it, 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 I don't think, and again, if you talk to guys like Bret Hart or Stone, yeah. all those guys will tell you, man, hey, I love working with me. Yeah. They love working with me. When you defeated Shawn Michaels, I actually watched this one. You defeat Shawn Michaels, Triple yeah. H runs in the ring or something. I don't remember. I was a kid, I think. I was young. I'm only 30. and it was China, right? Yeah, yeah it was like it was yeah. for a, and it was uh, um, Degeneration Mr. Perfect X. or somebody was in there. Wait, uh, it was a Degeneration X night, or yes, something, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, do you remember that? De- no, Degeneration no, X, do you remember no, them? No. Like, ah, you don't remember that? The suck it you used to, yeah, wait, yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't yeah. remember that name, okay. So, like, I remember watching you and being like thinking as a kid because I already kind of knew who you were, and I was a kid, and I remember being like damn, this guy's, like, wrestling, this is, like, real. Like, this guy's going to kill these dudes. Yeah. And you brought, like, this edge to it yeah. for a second because my dad knew who you were. My dad loves fighting and wrestling. He owned bars and sports bars and nightclubs right. and stuff. So he's like, oh, this guy's going to kill him. Like, because it had such an edge, right? right. And, and I hate to keep you here longer. It's already an hour and a half. Yeah. We're about to wrap up. But I got to hear your point of view on this. So many people out here, when we walk out of this podcast, we've had these crazy debates. Myself, Loco, my producer, Wayne, Vinny, my cousin, Maria. Everybody talks about, the icons in wrestling fade away now because social media, you can't believe in it anymore. Like, you know who The Rock is. You see him on Instagram in the gym. You know Triple H. You know The Undertaker's a real person. Like, when I was younger, if I saw Triple H, it was Triple H and, like, Freddy, Freddy Cougar were, like, my right. worst enemies. Like, I was like, no, I don't want to see those guys in my dream, you know? Right. If I saw Kane, I'm like, I just want to know but who's they're not. The but they're not human, right? But, like, yeah, they're, they're and not now human. they're humanized because yes. they have social media. Do you feel that that's kind of what made this now? It, now it's kind of more of, like, the in a good way, but it's this circus feel now when you go to these WrestleManias, right? It's cash money everywhere and all these things. Do you feel, is that where it's turned? No, I, I think it's more of the storytelling now in, in wrestling where mm. it's more of this chain wrestling where there's move after move after move after high spot after high spot after move, 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 high spot. There is no psychology 
to wrestling. It's just one move after another move. Not to say it's not exciting because it's fun to watch, but I think when you're telling a story, you got a heel and a baby face and there's a story being told and it's already been told for three weeks. Here, there's none, really none of that. Everything is just so fast and it's all about how many moves you can do in a row. Mm -hmm. And it's not about selling. Like literally a guy takes a punch and he sells it for two minutes. Uh, there's, there's none of that. It's just so fast. And it's because of the way TikTok and all these social media platforms yeah. are working. That's why we're doing what we're doing with the bare knuckle. I have so with the, right. with the, with the no ropes and, and no mm -hmm. clinching because you want fights to happen fast. Mm. So you have to kind of do all of these different programs, including wrestling. So that people are getting the action now. This is, he's the second person I've heard say that mm -hmm. about pro wrestling, like the no story stuff no more. But he might be right. It probably is about uh, TikTok and stuff because I've been, I've been watching TikTok more and more. And I hate to admit this, but I have even slower uh, attention span than I used yep. to. Yeah, because yep. you're getting it now, and your brain is now getting used to the action. You don't want to wait for that story to play out. You want it to play out now. Right. I'm all I do is consume content, and if you ask any of my guys in a meeting, I, I can't have a meeting for more than one minute without being like, yo, let's move on. You ask any of my guys, yeah. I'm like, let's move on. Yeah, get to like, the point. Yeah, like, because I'm so used to making content where I just need the answer. I need to show them something and kind of move along there. How are we going to get away from that? How are we going to... How it's we going not. You can't. Not. You got to it, retool. You you have to go. You have to move just like we're doing with our, our fight league, and everybody else is going to do the same. You got you to give them that content now. Mm -hmm. It has to happen now, and you got to follow suit. This. I kind of I love the fact that he at six years old, best shape, yeah. kill anybody in here and understand social media, <laughs> wrestling like, legend, like, MMA you legend. You're like the you ultimate guy. Gotta give guy. it to me now, man. That's You're it. like the ultimate guy's guy. You need to do a commercial for Traeger. You yeah. need to be one of the like all you need is like you you're the face of like Calabasas or Dick Sporting Goods. It's this guy right here. This is what America <laughs> yeah. is. Yeah. 100%. You got, you, or how many you sponsors you got? How many sponsors you got on that on that? That that uh, organization. How many sponsors? Oh, uh, we've we've got several. Um, nice and new ones coming in too because yeah. we're growing. So nice. it's 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 doing good. Um, like I said, we got some restructuring we have to do first before we do our next event. But that shouldn't take too long. How yeah. many of those shows have you had? Two. Yeah. Oh, very so we're new. new. Yeah, we're oh. really new. Yeah. So like BKFC and all those guys that do tr tremendous content. These guys are pushing out. Yeah. Um, but we're just trying to be a little bit different. And yeah. I think that they've got a spot for themselves and they're doing really well. And I think we can slide in there somewhere and, and do what we do. Ours is a little bit different. And so yeah. we're trying to, trying to, trying to change a little bit than what somebody else is already doing. Like you see UFC doing, um, we're going to come in and do something a little bit different. Man, it's a great mm -hmm. time for, um, what, you know, fighting sports right now because now we got bare knuckle MMA. You got that bare knuckle. You got karate. Oh, it's amazing time. I, I was thinking about doing a um, show in Mexico years ago. I thought of this show and it needed a, a new cage, but I was like, I don't got time to do all that. It's it's a lot of work. It's a man, lot of work. Uh, to, and you got to, and it's not just putting like before you could just throw a show together. Now it's all kinds of content. You got to have all kinds of shooting. You got to have social media platforms. You got to have people writing different things to to press release. I mean, just so much to it anymore yeah, that you I, can't just put a show on. I don't have the, I, like I said I don't have the attention to, to to do all that work. I'm gonna need too many people working for me. It, that's it. I just don't yeah. want to do it. I don't want to yeah. do the work. I just want to I just want to dream up the idea yeah. and have somebody do it. Like yeah. hey, here, do this. I, yeah. I don't sleep. I don't yeah. sleep. I'm dreaming yeah. the ideas and I'm trying to work with him every day. And he's he's killing it. He's in here every day. Same concept. We trying to build one of the biggest combat sports slash sports slash entertainment podcast media channels. Like we want to be able to help fights and. We want to be able to highlight the new generation of X Games athletes and kind of combine that and really build a culture and community. That's one thing that the podcast, so I've been on you so heavy, bugging yeah, you nonstop yeah, to get here because yeah. you're one of the most requested guests, you know? Well, People you guys got a it. great start, man. Yeah. I love it here. Yeah. You got a good setup here. It's kind of all kind of built towards the same thing. Right? Yeah. It's all, yeah. all trying to- Culture and community, bring athletes. it together. Yep. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Let us know when your, when your next event is, even <laughs> yeah. if we can't come, at least we can- a uh, post about oh, it absolutely. And, and we can, and we can absolutely we could talk about it maybe interview some of your 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 main events that would be yep. great yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah we could for sure do something where we can you can send us the champ when once yes. you crown your first yeah. champ when do you crown your first champion uh we already got mark godbeer was our first champion cool yeah. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, we'll do something with them yeah. and maybe have you guys come out and talk about it. That would be yeah. awesome. Fly and Lavar La, big big uh, Lavar Big Johnson was uh, just won the title. So. Nice. Mm -hmm. Nice. Do you yeah. have any ex UFC guys in there from like guys that like Roy is fighting and you have these guys that are all fighting bare knuckle. Are you going to bring in any UFC guys? Yeah, we, um, again, in our first event, we had, I mean, Mighty Mo. 
Oh yeah, uh, yeah. He fought for us. Yeah. Oh, Mighty Mo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So could you fought so could you. Mighty Mo? Oh, so could you? Yeah. yeah. Oh, so yeah. Um, we had some big names, man. Sick. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is going to be a phenomenal year for I'm Combat Sports. I'm smashing a girl Mighty Mo used to smash. <laughs> well, there's a, You're hey, there's smashing a, a girl Mighty Mo used to smash? <laughs> hey, that's a TikTok I, thing. Yeah, yeah. Wow, <laughs> hey, that's a TikTok yeah, thing. I didn't, I, didn't know, I didn't know that he used to smash it, so then I got it out of her. I got it. How do you get it out of her? Like, you pulled was him she, out of was her? That, was that pillow talk or something? Yeah, like, what is it? What yeah, you yeah. Talk, you asked, I was like, hey. I was like, I was like, hey, right. am, I, am I the first fighter that... Uh, you ever smash? And she was like, no, but she wouldn't tell me because I met her at, at a Risen fight in yeah. Japan. Oh, oh, okay. Well, there it is right there. there. Well, there's that a connection. Always, that Japan. Always, Japan. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah. all ties back to yeah. Rabhungi and Shibuya. Yeah. There you go, dude. Yeah. Like, damn, I'm like, me they, and my Stay Mo? consistent. No, stay, no. stay consistent. Yeah. Lions Den Way. I'm like, what? All right, how, how are we both your type? Me and Mighty Mo. How are we both your type? Listen, I, I want to I wanna say thank you. It's almost oh, two hours here. All right, we probably do this all day. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's it's phenomenal, and and thank you for the humbleness and honest honestly the way you talk about everything, just so honest and free. You could tell that the audience is going to get a good side of you, and and I and I love that. That's the best part about this thing. Yeah, so I we you guys we couldn't thank you thank more. You. Yeah, thank you for taking time to come down. Appreciate you, brother. Guys, yeah, make sure you guys go Jackson.com. We just dropped our brand new Cuban eight millimeter. Plus, we have a ton of new other chains, and you can use promo code Podcast fifteen. We also have our new solid gold collection, and everything is solid silver, real, real gold, real gold, real silver, real silver made in Italy. Jackson.com. I'm Bear to GDO with the best and the one and only Ten Toes Down Rampage Jackson. He's texting his girl saying, "Yo, I love you, baby." But <laughs> hey, but but we found <laughs> but we found something out today. We out. We out. <laughs>